understand your good. Well, I'm certainly not a constitutional lawyer, Senator. Well, you remember and when we were in law school, we studied the famous principle of law that came from England and also is well known in this country that no matter how humble a man's cottage is, that even the king of England can't enter without his consent? I'm afraid that's been considerably eroded over the years, hasn't it? Down in my country, we still think it's pretty legitimate <laughs> principle of law. <laughs> In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in combination with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. It's a brave man who comes to debate the Constitution and the powers of the presidency with Sam Irvin, but John Ehrlichman did that today. A good part of his second day before the Senate committee was spent in legal argument in an attempt to justify the burglary of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist by the White House plumbers. The rest of the time, Ehrlichman spent in denying the testimony of other witnesses and accusing the late J. Edgar Hoover of bureaucratic puffery. He accused John Dean of lying and John Mitchell of having a hazy memory. And he reiterated that he had no complicity in the Watergate cover-up. The committee will spend at least another day with Ehrlichman, <clears throat> and possibly two. Outside the caucus room world of Ehrlichman and Wilson versus Irvin and his applauding audience, there were other developments related to the Watergate crisis. President Nixon met this morning with the Republican congressional leadership. Vice President Agnew was there, and so was Republican National Chairman George Bush. When the meeting broke up, GOP Senate Leader Hugh Scott said he felt the Irvin Committee was correct in pursuing the subpoena of White House tapes and documents, but he predicted that the President would ultimately triumph in the Supreme Court. The Republican House Leader, Gerald Ford, said he did not feel that the President's decision to withhold the tapes was having any adverse effect on the President's support in Congress. He said there had been a solidification of the of Republican backing of the President. But Senator Robert Dole of Kansas, Bush's predecessor as head of the Republican Party, said on the NBC's Today Show that he felt the president should tell all about Watergate. If the president's not involved, why not inform some of us? I think it's long past that we can say the Watergate will just go away, said the senator. Also, a Lou Harris poll released today contained, among other things, the results that 60 percent of its sample feel that the president should release the tapes and papers. The next round in the confrontation will come tomorrow, and Peter Kay has a report on that. Tomorrow will bring another milestone in the continuing constitutional battle among the White House, the Senate Watergate Committee, and Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. Subpoenas direct President Nixon to deliver presidential documents and tapes to the committee and the Cox by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, but nobody really expects that to happen. Instead, Senator Sam Irvin told reporters today that he expects the White House to seek to quash the subpoenas. That legal maneuver would propel the thing into federal court and eventually to the U.S. Supreme Court. If the White House doesn't act, Irvin says the committee has two choices. First of all, it can seek a contempt citation by the whole Senate against the President, but Irvin indicates he doesn't want to do that. The other alternative is to seek a declaratory judgment. The uh, declaratory judgment declares uh, rights and uh, responsibilities, and uh, under the Declaratory Judgment Act, uh, the uh, court could render a decision that it was duty that the, that, uh, the uh, Senate committee had a right to the tapes and uh, inf uh, uh, papers they were seeking, and that it was due to the President to uh, make those uh, tapes and uh, uh, papers available to the committee. Well, if the Supreme Court should render such a uh, verdict and in the favor of the Senate committee, is it clear to you that the President would intend to obey it? Well, unless the, uh, the, the uh, President, I, I would think he would obey it if he has any respect for law and order. What if he chooses to ignore it on the same grounds that he's already cited, that there is a separation of powers? Well, that battle would, if the Supreme Court sustained the uh, 
committee's position, that would be a, a, an adjudication that there was no such uh, right as that on his part. In a few minutes, right off the bat, you're going to be treated to 43 minutes of an argument over the constitutional powers of the President of the United States. John Kramer of the Georgetown University Law Center is with us now. Mr. Kramer, what guidance can you offer in understanding this argument? Well, assume you're a Supreme Court justice, and the basic issue you have to decide was, was the break-in of Mr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office justified by an inherent power residing in the President to waive the Fourth Amendment rights that normally protect your home and your office against unauthorized intrusions. Yesterday, there was a question that perhaps this was a statutory power. But today, as you will see, the statute is not in involved at all. All that is concerned is whether or not the Constitution authorizes the President to so do. So the first question is, does the power exist? And you will hear some talk about the steel seizure case in which the powers of the President were quite limited, some talk about the New York Times case in which the President's power to abrogate the First Amendment was limited. Then the question arises, if it exists, what are its preconditions? And there seem to be three which are gone over very heavily in the testimony. The first of all, there must be some express authorization by the President. And here we have a President who on May 22nd said, I at no time approved the break-in. Secondly, the matter must involve national security. And the question there is who decides whether national security is at stake? Is it up to the president alone, or may his judgment be reviewed by the courts? And the third issue is even if there is this power, can it be directed against innocent third parties who are not themselves the source of concern for national security, in this case, a psychiatrist? And finally, if the power exists, what are its limitations? Does it extend as far as robbery or murder? That, too, will be discussed. Okay, and you'll see the argument for yourself, the argument basically between Mr. Wilson and Senator Irvin. You can make your own decision. John Kramer will be back at the close of tonight's broadcast to talk about this and other subjects uh, concerning today's hearing session. He will be joined at that time by Alan Barr, longtime Washington journalist and author. Today's committee meeting was a short one. This will be one of the few evenings our replay ends before midnight. Here is our nightly summary of the day's chronology. In the first hour, Chairman Irvin and Ehrlichman lawyer John Wilson argue about presidential powers, with Wilson suggesting that the president holds a reservoir of constitutional power that has not been defined in court. And Irvin argues that the existence of the plumbers, not the problem of Ellsberg leaks, was an instance of domestic subversion. Ehrlichman resumes his testimony, and in the second hour, he says he never discussed clemency for the Watergate 7 because the president's marching orders would that there would be no clemency. And he argues with earlier testimony, saying he did not propose the destruction of sensitive documents from Howard Hunt's safe that were given to L. Patrick Gray. In the third hour, Ehrlichman argues that he had no part in any cover-up, and he disparages the FBI investigation of the Pentagon Papers leak, saying that a progress report from J. Edgar Hoover to Eagle Crowe was nothing but window dressing. Senator Irvin is now about ready to begin the day's activity. I understand uh, that Mr. Wilson wishes to address the committee on the legal question we are uh, discussing with Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Wilson yesterday, and without objection on the part of any member of the committee, I will extend to him an opportunity to do so at this time. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to say sincerely I'm very grateful to you for uh, giving me this opportunity. I have a feeling you, you have your own thoughts about this. And this may turn out to be an exercise in mental calisthenics, but it'll be fun anyway. I, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't quote the Bible like you can, but I'm reminded of the, of the high school uh, uh, physics anomaly and what happens when the irresistible force hits an immovable body. And uh, I, I don't know which is which at the moment. Thank you, sir. Now, seriously, if I may, uh, <clears throat> in connection with uh, Section 2511, uh, our exchange yesterday was so rapid that I was not able to get across to you the, the genesis of my thinking. Uh, 2511 to me is a symbol. Uh, I would not rely upon 2511 as a source of power. Uh, it's a it's a recognition of the possibility of a source of power. And uh, 
I uh, want to make a, a distinction immediately between uh, domestic security and foreign security because uh, I want to take my text from the Supreme Court's decision of last year in the case which has been variously called the Keith case because it involved a, a mandamus against Judge Keith in the Eastern District of Michigan or the Plamondon, P-L-A-M-O-N-D-O-N case because he was the, one, the, the principal of three conspirators in uh, that action. The case formally is known as United States Petitioner against the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan. It is found in uh, 407 uh, United States, 32 L.N. 2nd, 752, and 92 Supreme Court. I'm sure the chairman, maybe all members of the committee, have a familiarity with this decision. It's a, it's a tremendous decision. Written by uh, Mr. Justice Powell, uh, with uh, concurring opinions by uh, uh, Mr. Justice Douglas and Mr. Dust Justice uh, White. Now, the state of the law today is that the point which uh, uh, I am uh, arguing has not yet been uh, passed upon by any court that I know of. But the Supreme Court has left the question wide open, if you please. Uh, I thought I had before me, and I don't want to take too much time because I promised Senator Talbot I wouldn't take more than 20 minutes to get through this because I'm usurping his time at the moment. But uh, there is a, the Senate report 1096, I think it is, on the Safe Streets Bill of 1968, of which 2511 is a portion. And of course, as far as the chairman is concerned, I, I know that uh, this is all hat to him. But there is in the report a section on national security which recognizes a reservoir of power in the President of the United States with respect to foreign intelligence foreign leaks, this sort of thing. Now, uh, I uh, anticipated that if anybody has uh, inquired into uh, some of the things which I've done in the practice of the law, 21 years ago, I was in the steel seizure case. I filed the first suit on behalf of Youngstown Sheet and Tube, and uh, the case today bears the name of my client. In that case, I fought vigorously against the uh, inherent power of, the pres of President Truman to seize the coal mines. We were met with the defense, and I had a, a good deal to do with the argument before Judge Pine, which was the decisive, first decisive opinion. I carried the uh, the whole matter in the Court of Appeals for a day or two, whatever it took. And then there were 35 of us lawyers who wanted to argue in the Supreme Court. And we all agreed upon Mr. John W. Davis, whom I would call the greatest. And uh, the Supreme Court, as you know, sustained our contention that there was not an, uh, an, a package of inherent powers in, in President Truman to make that seizure. Now, this case is unlike that uh, case because there is a reservoir of constitutional power recognized uh, at least hypothetically by the Congress, by your own committee, sir, by the, uh, by the bill which was, which was passed. Uh, in the Keith or Plamaton decision, uh, both uh, Senator McClellan, who I I believe was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and Senator Hart were quoted in their debates on the floor. And they make it plain that uh, 
Section 2511 was not intended to, to uh, restrict or, ex or extend the power of the president. It was simply a, uh, a uh, reserving clause with respect to whatever power he had. Now, my proposition is, and I want to come to the Plamadon case, my proposition is succinctly st stated on the basis of my reading of the, of the Supreme Court's decision in the Plamadon case is that in a domestic security case, and that was that case, despite the fact that Plamadon bombed the CIA headquarters in Chicago, it was treated by the Supreme Court time and time again as a domestic security case. And I do not have to rely upon inferences when I tell you that the Supreme Court said we are not passing upon the power of the president with regard to foreign intelligence. Now, the proposition that I'm offering to you and other members of the committee, if you please, sir, is that while it has been settled in the Plamadon case that for domestic security purposes, the Fourth Amendment uh, rears its protective head, and despite whatever may be the constitutional power of the president, he must apply for a prior judicial action in order to uh, carry out uh, wiretapping of a domestic security case. As you well know, and as other members of the committee who are students of constitutional law know that, I'm not sure he was the first one to say this, but Mr. Justice Douglas calls the Fourth Amendment the warrant clause. And uh, he, uh, he does what I think all scholars do in this area, and I'm Paul Patrick. Paul Patton, then. Did I get that out right? I'm not sure. In that, uh, the warrant clause seems to be a clear part of the preceding provision in the same article for that there shall not be any unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, as you know, seizures which are reasonable may be done. You know, of course, that the warrant clause does not always apply to search, searches and seizures. You know that an arrest by a police officer of a felony, on, on probable belief that a felony was committed, where he arrests a man inside his house, he may search the house or the immediate vicinity where the, where the okay. arrested man is. He does not have a warrant. He did not have the warrant for the arrest. He did not have the warrant for the search. So there is some incursion upon the idea of searches and seizures. But coming directly to how I read the Keith or Plamadon case, and it is extremely interesting that I don't remember ever reading before that the Supreme Court would call upon the oath of the president in the, fall, in the second article of the Constitution, the fourth clause, as a source of power. As you know, it says to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And I have not found, perhaps uh, the chairman is uh, way ahead of me on this, I've not found any case where a source of, a con of a presidential power has been drawn from the language of the oath. Or whether it has before or whether it has not, the imprimatur of the Supreme Court through Justice Powell has now been put upon the language of the oath as a source of power. And it is a source of power as the court says, and I'll read the beginning of this paragraph. We have begun the inquiry by noting that the President of the United States has the fundamental duty under Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution 
quote, to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, close quote. Implicit in that duty is the power to protect the gov our government against those who would subvert or overflow it by unlawful means. And it goes on to say, in the exercise of that power, the Attorney General may be uh, authorized to issue uh, permissions to, to tap wires. Now, mind you, this case ends up with a result that because the tapping in this case, with the approval of the Attorney General, and on the, on, on the basis, let's say, of the, of the philosophy of 2511, the, the Supreme Court said that because it involved domestic security, it did not abrogate, supersede, or otherwise lay aside the Fourth Amendment. But the question is wide open, if you please, as to whether, in the case of foreign intelligence, uh, the, the, the cloak of the Fourth Amendment wraps itself around the president and requires prior judicial action. Now, 2511 has had the effect of saying that uh, in certain instances mentioned therein, the uh, president uh, will not violate the wiretapping law by proceeding to tap for purposes stated in there. It goes on to say that the taps which are obtained are admissible in evidence and are not subject to the, in my, I'm adding this, are not subject to judicial attack. Now, the Supreme Court in the Pamaton case. Is that, uh, isn't that the same case as United States versus United States District Court? I gave it as, uh, a few minutes ago as being the formal citation. <clears throat> But I didn't want to have to say that every yeah. time I cite the case. Yeah. I don't want to like to have to use that uh, big, uh, hard to pronounce uh, you and I uh, surname. About, you and I are thinking about the same case. Yes, sir. Now, uh, no, nobody can dispute me on one point, and I'm being, I'm sticking my neck way out, that the Supreme Court reserved the question of the use of the reservoir of a possible reservoir. Let me put it that way of constitutional power reposed in the president to violate the law in respect of foreign intelligence, of foreign espionage, and foreign collaborations. That is in here I can turn a half a dozen times to Justice Powell's position in making it clear that he was not deciding that question. Now, my position is that if uh, there is this reservoir of power, and your own committee, sir, in reporting out the Safe Street Streets Act a bill in 1968, uh, was willing to uh, give an indication that there existed a reservoir of power for the purpose of well, what I say, and this is my language, for the purpose of permitting the president to, to do what would otherwise be a crime uh, to uh, protect the nation against foreign intelligence and for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence. Now, I know I'm, I'm open to the attack. Uh, well, can he shoot somebody on the street? Uh, I'm not going that far, and uh, I, that's, that's, that is driving myself uh, to a conclusion not ad absurdum. But my view is that, as you know, you all know, wiretapping is a form of invasion of the premises of the person who is overheard. And in the Katz and the Burger cases, which I'm sure all of you are familiar, uh, the Supreme Court has said, and now in this sophisticated age, 
wiretapping is another kind of invasion of the privacy and premises of the man whose conversation is being bugged, so to speak. So that uh, we have squarely, we're not driving this problem any further today than saying that it is not a silly proposition. Now, you, Mr. Chairman, you didn't call it silly. You, uh, you made me feel it was, but uh, you didn't say it. It is not a silly proposition for us to contend that an entry into the psychiatrist's office on the grounds which would be technically state burglary, because there's no federal crime in that respect, is no different from an entry through his telephone system. And if your committee, by your committee, I'm not speaking of this august body, I'm speaking of another august body, that is the Judiciary Committee. If, if, and, and I don't find uh, that you, sir, or anyone else dissented from the philosophy of the report of the Senate, which went on out of the floor in support of that bill, that there is very likely a reservoir of constitutional power, unlike the steel case, in the president in the matter of national security. That's the reason, sir, that I made so bold yesterday, and I want to apologize for what might have been a rude interruption. <coughs> when I asked you to read the latter part of the first sentence, or to protect national security information against foreign intelligence activities. This is the kind of thing which I pick out of the symbol of 2511, lay it on top of the Pan Pan Panama case, and say that today there is no one living, indeed there is no one in this room, who can assert with categorical certainty that the President of the United States does not have the constitutional power to cause the entry under what would be otherwise illegal circumstances in pursuit of foreign intelligence. And I say again without fear of contradiction that we are invited <coughs> to consider when we get to that point that the Fourth Amendment may have vanished from the scene. Uh, I think I must be running close to my 20 minutes. And I'm like you are, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to trespass upon it. I, uh, I do have some very excellent phrases from Justice Powell's decision. Uh, let me just conclude by quoting one from a section in his brief which has a Roman numeral four. We emphasize before concluding this opinion the scope of our decision. As stated at the outset, this case involves only the domestic aspects of national security. We have not addressed and expressed no opinion as to the issues which may be involved with respect to the activities of foreign powers or their agents. And there's a footnote that is interesting. For the view that warrantless surveillance, though impermissible in domestic security cases, may be constitutional where foreign powers are concerned, see United States against Smith in a Fed sub case decided in 1971, and a treatise, I'm adding the word treatise, by the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Project standards related to electronic surveillance in February 1971. See also United States versus Clay in 430 Federal Second 165. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, Mr. Wilson, I've uh, enjoyed your argument. I have long known you to be one of the nation's truly great lawyers. And I would like to say, if I was, I'm a sort of a country lawyer myself, 
And uh, sometimes I get uh, sort of emphatic in the statement of my views because I don't want to, I've never been able to straddle fences very well. Uh, I, I agree with your interpretation of the case of the United States versus United States District Court. In this case, the government was taking a position which was long maintained by a former Attorney General uh, Mitchell that the President had inherent power to exercise surveillance without a warrant from any court under, in respect to, to uh, detect uh, subversive or uh, domestic subversion. And of course, in this case, in uh, the case you referred to, the government took the position that Section 2511.3 uh, uh, argued that the inaccept, uh, except the national security surveillance from the Acts Warrant requirement, Congress recognizes the President's authority to conduct such surveillances without prior judicial approval. Justice Powell said uh, Section 2511.3 certainly confers no power, as the language is wholly inappropriate for such a purpose. It merely provides that the act shall not be interpreted to limit or disturb such power as the President may have under the Constitution. And then his ultimate decision was that uh, we therefore think the conclusion inescapable that Congress only intended to make clear that the act simply did not legislate with respect to national security surveillances. Now, I served on the Judiciary Committee when Section uh, uh, 2511 of, uh, of uh, Title 18 was drawn. And of course, if we hadn't put this in that, the same thing would have resulted because Congress couldn't take away any constitutional power of the President. So they merely uh, uh, they put that in there because it was a controversy between some members of the committee have an opinion that the President has almost uh, powers that would make an Eastern potentate turn green with envy. And some people, like myself on the committee, believe that uh, the Constitution limits and defines the powers of the President. Some people believe in the doctrine of inherent powers. I don't think the President has any power at all except what the Constitution expressly gives him or such powers as are necessarily uh, uh, inferred from the express powers. I think that's the reason he wrote the Constitution, to keep the, the President, uh, uh, as well as Congress, and the courts from exercising tyrannical power. And uh, the, well, I, 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 don't, I, I don't agree with that this case has any application whatever to the situation. We, I agree with you, it has no application to the situation we discuss it. But where you and I part company is on the facts. Uh, I don't think we have a rather anomalous situation here. Here was the government. They weren't prosecuting Ellsberg through the agents of the Department of Justice for giving papers to Russia. They were just merely charging him with stealing some uh, papers that belonged to the government, as I recall. And here is uh, some employees of the White House go out and, for some strange reason, I guess, trying to further the didn't trust the Justice Department do the prosecuting all by itself. So they decided that they ought to go and steal some uh, documents from uh, the doctor of a man who was being prosecuted from stealing from the government, which is quite a peculiar situation, really. <laughs> now, uh, I can't see the slightest relationship between uh, Dr. Fielders, I believe his name was, notions of the mental state of Daniel Ellsberg and foreign intelligence activities. The only activity I think the doctor was engaged in was trying to determine what the mental state of his patient was. He wasn't engaged in any foreign intelligence activities, and I think just my interpretation of the Constitution, I think that the emissaries that were sent out there for the, for the plumbers to try to steal the doctor's notes were a domestic uh, subversion and not a defense of this country against uh, foreign intelligence activities. Now, I think your Steele case, which I think is one of the remarkable cases, 
they held in that case, and I'm sure by largely on the basis of the very uh, persuasive and convincing arguments you made, that the president, that even though the United States was engaged in war in Korea and needed steel in order that the men fighting that war might have weapons and munitions, and even though uh, industrial disputes were about to close down the source of that steel, namely the steel plant, they held that the President of the United States didn't have any inherent power in the Constitution to seize steel mills for the purpose of securing the flow of munitions and weapons to American soldiers locked in battle with a foreign foe. And I think that's pretty persuasive authority. If that's so, the President doesn't have any inherent power under the Constitution <coughs> to see, see steel mills in order that he might uh, carry on a war and uh, punish uh, weapons and munitions and enable the soldiers to fight and protect themselves against destruction at the hands of the enemies. I just think that is authority for the proposition that the President has no, uh, uh, the president has no inherent power to see steel mills in time of war, to carry on a war, has no inherent authority to steal a document from a psychiatrist's office in time of peace. Mr. Chairman, may I may I have two minutes to pardon me, Mr. Yes, sir. If I may, Mr. Wilson, before you respond, and I'll be glad to yield if you care to respond in advance. But before you do, I'd like to, if Senator Talmadge is agreeable to yield for a few moments so I can inject one or two other thoughts in this. Delighted to yield to my friend from Tennessee. I thank you, sir. I'd like to suggest two or three more points that you might like to reply to when you do reply to the statements made by the chairman, if that's agreeable. To begin with, the chairman is fond of pointing out from time to time that he is just a country lawyer. He omits to say that he graduated from Harvard Law School with honors. Senator from Tennessee will yield. I'd like to say a word in my own defense on that point. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend introduce me to North Carolina audience. He said he understood I was graduating from Harvard Law School, but thank God nobody would ever suspect it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also reminded, Mr. Chairman, by this this really remarkable colloquy between Mr. Wilson, the distinguished attorney, and the chairman, the distinguished lawyer, of uh, a case that a young lawyer argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, his first one, and he argued very eloquently and persuasively, and the Chief Justice said, young man, that's not the law. And the young fellow says, well, it was the law until your honor spoke. <laughs> So really, it seems to me that both of you have identified a basic and fundamental element of this colloquy. That is, the court has not spoken on the theorem to which you address your attention. But that then launches me into two or three other things that I'd like to suggest for your consideration. There is no doubt in my mind that there is the doctrine of implied power implied power of the presidency in certain respects that I shan't enumerate at this time, and implied powers of the Congress. This committee sits by reason of implied powers. There is no reference in the Constitution to the authority of a congressional committee to in conduct this investigation, but the power is clearly ancillary and necessary to the functioning, to the intelligent functioning of a legislative body, that is, the inquiry into a factual situation in uh, uh, a predetermination of the desirability or the undesirability of legislative remedies. So the doctrine of implied powers appears clear. The question is how they are implied, to what extent, and what do they say? If we address ourselves carefully to the proposition and the theorem that Mr. Wilson suggests, that there is a reservoir of power in terms of national security, not spelled out with particularity in the Constitution, 
but necessary as an aid to the functioning of the presidential role as Commander-in-Chief and as Chief Executive Officer of the government, and that they include an abridgment, if you please, of the Fourth Amendment in the event that the national security role applies, then it seems to me that the traditional and ordinary rules of construction require us first to try to look at the four corners of the document, which is a fairly cavalier way to refer to the charter document, the Constitution, but to look at the Constitution and all of the amendments to see where and from what source and from what clause or amendment such implied powers might flow. And that if we find conflict, as your theorem suggests, between the inherent authority of the Commander-in-Chief or the Chief Executive Officer of the government to protect the national security vis-a-vis -vis the determination of foreign intelligence activity, we have a further responsibility under the doctrine of construction to reconcile apparent conflicts within the Constitution, in this case the role of the Commander-in-Chief and the requirements of national security, and the fairly explicit and direct requirements of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, to reconcile them as we, if we can, just as we try to reconcile the apparently conflicting testimony of witnesses who appear before this committee. And that if we can't reconcile them, then we resort to the most logical inferences we can in determining what the authors decided. The doctrine of construction itself, you determine legislative history only if the document will not speak unambiguously for itself. That then finally leads me into the question I'd like to put. It seems to me that we have a factual question here. It is entirely possible to construct an attractive legal theorem that the President does or does not have this inherent authority, this reservoir of power, in terms of national defense. It is entirely possible to construct a theorem that that does not subsist and endure in the face of a contravening requirement of the Fourth Amendment, as Senator Irvin indicates. But don't we really then have to test both of those theorems? against a range of factual situations. Wouldn't it be appropriate then to test, since the court has not spoken on the subject, to test the proposition by saying, could the president authorize a trespass, which otherwise would be a criminal trespass, against the private property of a person or a physician in order to determine whether or not a domestic legislative proposal had leaked to the press? Or would the president be authorized to do uh, such things if they had reason to believe that uh, preliminary planning for foreign policy formulation was in jeopardy of disclosure? Or would the president have such activity if he believed that a signal communication system, for instance, for a foreign power was about to initiate a preemptive nuclear strike against the United States? Now, all the, the theorem would apply to all three situations, but the factual situation would be very different, it seems to me. And the court, in construing this situation, might look at it very differently. It would call to a varying degree on his authority to protect this nation against invasion, whether by troops or by nuclear weapons, or to guarantee the privacy and the integrity of, pub, of private premises and uh, of functions. So. If we do apply a range of factual situations to this theorem, how does it wear? How durable is it? How sensitive is the Irvin theorem or the Wilson theorem to the application of these several factual situations, and thus how does that aid us in arriving at a logical uh, solution to the problem? Now, ultimately, I suppose a court will have to decide that. But until a court does, this committee has the ongoing and further responsibility to examine it according to the present law, which is uncertain. And therefore, isn't the central fact issue probable cause? That is, what basis, what basis was there for believing that there was a foreign security threat before the Wilson theorem would apply, even in opposition to the Irvin theorem? So aren't we confronted with what we've been confronted with more or less throughout these hearings, and that is, what do the facts show? What is the reasonable basis for believing that a national security problem existed, and of what gravity 
before we can apply ourselves to the abstract theorem of the law. Thank you, Mr. I just, if Senator Cameron's indulged, I'll make one more observation and I'll subside. I would like to argue, but I'm not going to, that you can't imply a power that contradicts an express power of provision. But that's not my point. I don't, I don't believe that Mr. Erdogan conceded that the President of the United States was a man that ordered this burglary. I thought this burglary was, all, was carried out by Mr. E. Howard Hunt, and I don't think that Mr. E. Howard Hunt has any in, in, implied or inherent power in the Constitution of the United States to commit burglary. Mr. Chairman, just so the record is clear in the, in the description of the legal dilemma we find ourselves in, I hope I do not imply that uh, the President authorized this. I'll stand on the record whatever develops in that respect, and that certainly was not the implication. I use that language simply for the sake of simplification and to direct the attention of the Chairman and Mr. Wilson to the corollary requirements of the statute. I'd like to put in the record here for no objection a copy, or about a copy of the statute. May I, may I reply to both of you for a moment, Mr. Senator Thomas? Uh, immediately to Senator Baker, uh, in this really uh, Bible on the subject of this Pamaton case, Justice Powell discusses, and I think in a footnote, that uh, at times it's difficult to find the line between, uh, between domestic uh, security and foreign security. National security is a broad word. It's a, it's a misleading word in itself because national security might envelop both. But he, he recognizes that uh, the try to answer both of you with this one answer, and that is, uh, on the basis, as Senator Baker puts it, probable cause. Uh, that's, that's, that's as good a name for it as anything. I think if you'll go back to my symbol, 2511, you'll see that uh, the chairman's uh, committee on the judiciary reposed in the president's own absolute discretion by the use of the words he deems necessary to protect the nation uh, so that, so that uh, uh, I'm arguing that when it comes to the exercise of this reservoir of power in a foreign intelligence case, and I want to come to the facts for a moment on that and quit, uh, that in that case, it's the president's discretion which is, which is uh, to, to, to be guided. Now, there is testimony here by Mr. Ehrlichman that the Russians either had or were getting this information. Now, this isolation that the chairman puts Mr. Ellsberg and his psychiatrist in is, I'm, I submit, uh, uh, I'm looking for a, a general adjective, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, it's unfair for you to do that, if you'll forgive the brusqueness of that observation. Uh, the, the genesis of this was either the fact that the papers had been passed to the Russians or that there was reasonable ground to be probable cause, Senator Baker, to believe that they were going to the Russians. Now, this puts the cap of, uh, of foreign intelligence, not a cap, a com not even an umbrella, a complete cloak upon this whole transaction. Now, I, 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 want, to, I want to end by reading what uh, the uh, Judiciary Committee with no dissent from the chairman, uh, whom I respect very greatly, and uh, I wish to return the compliment to him, and I think he's one of the greatest, uh, the following under the heading of national security. It is obvious that whatever means are necessary should and must, this, this is the Senate's language, Senate committee's language. It is obvious that whatever means are necessary should and must be taken to protect the national security interest, period. Wiretapping and electronic surveillance techniques are proper means for the acquisition of counterintelligence against the hostile action of foreign powers. Next sentence. Nothing in the proposed legislation seeks to disturb the power of the president to act in this area. And the final sentence. 
limitations that may be deemed proper in the field of domestic affairs of a nature of a nation become artificial when international relations and internal security are at stake. Mr. Chairman, may I may I end with a with a, a respectful quip about the country lawyers? I have a story too. Uh, <laughs> I was testifying before Senator Dirksen's committee one time on the Trading with the Enemy Act. And one of the distinguished lawyers from Senator Baker's state, Mr. Cecil Sims, I imagine you know him, uh, gentlemen, was testifying against me. And he started out by saying, I'm just a country lawyer. Well, of course, he's as smart as a whip. And, and uh, when he said that, I said, well, I've always been scared of anybody who describes himself as a country lawyer. And Senator Dirksen, in his lovable way, said, well, Mr. Wilson, I've seen you pounding the asphalt streets of Washington for the last, I don't know how many years it was then, probably 35. And I don't think anybody would ever charge you with being a country lawyer. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, the temptation to trespass on time of the committee is very great, but I will refrain, and when my turn comes around next, I'll make some more observations on this point. Maybe I'll have a rebuttal, maybe I'll have a rebuttal then. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ehrlichman following up the same line of thought. I believe you testified yesterday the President has the power to authorize an inherent break-in in matters concerning national security. Was that your testimony? I don't think I could add very much to the much more learned discussion this morning, Senator, but that I was referring to this body of of law that has been discussed here this morning. Your answer is in the affirmative. Yes, is that sir. Correct? Now, in matters involving national security, could the president authorize a forgery? Well, uh, again, you're getting me into an area that obviously uh, uh, is a subject for the experts. And uh, as Mr. Wilson pointed out this morning, uh, uh, the, the question of degree here uh, can be carried to uh, unreasonable lengths, and I'm, I'm not prepared to answer where that line is. That's obviously a judicial question. You don't think he could authorize murder, do you? I don't. I, 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 as I say, I don't think I'm the one to try and uh, respond to that kind of question as to where the line is. Would you authorize this break-in, didn't you? I was trying to... No, sir, I did not. Uh, you affirmed it yesterday in a memorandum that I saw. You said it was your signature, provided it could not be traced. No, sir. I, I submit that that is not what that memorandum says. Document? What that memorandum says is that the investigation, which had previously been authorized by me, should also include an attempt to ascertain the contents of these files. There's nothing in there about the means to be pursued, and my testimony was and continues to be that my assumption was that that could be done by completely conventional investigatory means. I read the language. Covert operation to be undertaken to examine all of the medical files still held by Ellsberg psychiatrist. How do you think you could examine all the medical files without a break-in? Well, uh, it has occurred to me since, because I've been asked this question before, that uh, one way that it could be done is through uh, false pretenses. Through uh, or through perfectly uh, or through perfectly honest <laughs> through perfectly honest means uh, one doctor to another by recruiting the assistance of another of another psychiatrist or of a doctor or of a uh, of someone who uh, could get at them that way. I now I'm not a I'm not a trained investigator, Senator, and and uh, uh, what I know from my own experience is that people who are trained investigators, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, insurance yeah. adjusters, people of that kind, uh, have over the years uh, brought to attorneys uh, information of this kind, which they've been given the assignment of, of gaining. And it, it, it simply was not in contemplation that uh, a break-in as such uh, would be engaged in. I don't think there's any need in rehashing all of that. You covered it yesterday. But you did state that you approved it if done under your assurance that it is not traceable. You affirm that? Approved, approved what, Senator? 
the covert operation to be undertaken to examine all of the medical files still held by Ellsberg psychoanalysts. I explained yesterday, Senator, that the my concern there and that the thing to which that handwritten note refers is that I was not keen to have anyone go out and be flashing uh, White House credentials yes. as a White House investigator. And um, I think that was sound. Now, if the President could authorize a covert break-in, and you don't know exactly where that power would be limited, you don't think it could include murder or other crimes beyond covert break-ins, do you? Oh, I don't, I don't know where the line is, Senator. Well, where is the check on the chief executive's inherent power as to where that power begins and ends? That's what I'm trying to determine. Well, again, I would have to incorporate by reference the, I think, the very valuable discussion that has taken place here this morning. I couldn't add to that. Well, you're a lawyer, and I understand you're a good one. Well, I'm certainly not a constitutional lawyer, Senator. Well, you remember and when we were in law it. school... We studied a famous principle of law that came from England and also is well known in this country that no matter how humble a man's cottage is, that even the king of England can't enter without his consent. I'm afraid that's been considerably eroded over the years, hasn't it? Down in my country, we still think it's pretty <laughs> legitimate principle of law. <laughs> Now, you authorized this in the name of national security, I believe. We believed that we had a serious national security problem at that time, yes, sir. Well, what relationship did Dr. Fielding have with national security? Well, the uh, CIA has perfected a technique, as I understand it, and again, I'm not your best witness on this, in which they can find out a lot about uh, uh, foreign agent, uh, a foreign uh, uh, official, someone who is the object of their investigation through the device of what they call a psychiatric profile. Two people in this special unit, Mr. Young and Mr. Hunt, had both had experience with the use of these profiles in the past. And they felt strongly that in this case, where there were so many unknowns, uh, we didn't know whether we were dealing here with a, a spy ring or a, 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 just an individual kook or whether we were dealing with a serious in, uh, uh, penetration of, of uh, the nation's military and other secrets. Uh, in such an uncertain situation that a profile of this kind might, certainly not positively, but might add some important additional ingredient which would, which would help to understand the dimensions of the problem. You don't Now, think... sir, I can't vouch for this. I have a, I have a kind of a, an inherent personal doubt about the, the psychiatry in general, but uh, I can't second guess. I can't second guess the investigation experts who have used this technique, and as I say, the, the CIA maintains a staff, and they do this thing on a regular basis, and it is used in our government. Now, uh, I understand from testimony before the McClellan Committee uh, that the, the CIA's position is that they have not ever used it before in a case of espionage invi involving a United States citizen. I don't know whether that is so or not. But in any event, the people involved here were very concerned about what they were dealing with, and uh, they felt that this would be a helpful technique. You didn't think that Dr. Fielding was a security risk to the country, did you? Of course not. Now, the, feel, the, the identity of the individual here had nothing to do with it, the, the doctor. The, the CIA had prepared a psychiatric profile, and it was not helpful. And when Mr. Young uh, went back to the CIA and said, this is not helpful, they said, well, we don't have enough raw material to go on. You're going to have to get us some more factual information. Uh, and so this was then an expansion of the original covert investigation of this individual and his uh, co-conspirators and his pattern and how he got these documents and so on to include 
the assemblage of such other information as might be helpful to the CIA in finishing this psychiatric profile project. Let me give you a similar situation and see how you would compare it. Suppose someone you knew to be subversive had rented a lockbox in one of the banks here in Washington and had put some suspected documents in that lockbox involving the national security. Do you think that would give you the authority to rob that bank and go in there and take those documents? I haven't, I haven't any idea what the extent of such a power would be. Don't you think it's a it's, good comparison? Sounds, it, no, I don't think it's a good comparison, You sir, were looking at medical records in one instance, and I'm telling you there were some documents in a bank that might really involve national security. Yes, but you've put the case where we're going to rob the bank. I don't think anybody, at least I certainly didn't contemplate, that anybody was going to rob we'll the doctor. change the word. Burglarize the bank. Well, let's suppose that it were possible... <laughs> make a request to the audience, and that is that the audience refrain from expressing its approval or disapproval of anything which occurs in connection with the interrogation of a witness. Mr. I Chairman, think it, I share that yeah, view, and I, I commend the chair for preserving order. I think it's in the national interest to do so, regardless of what the feelings or the emotions of the audience may be. This committee is engaged in trying to ascertain the facts. We're not conducting a show or an entertainment uh, program here. What I'm trying to do is find out what the authority of the President of the United States is to break and enter under what conditions and what other acts that do not conform to the law his authority may be. Mr. Chairman, I, could, I, could I say a word on that subject? I yield to the Senator from Tennessee. I thoroughly concur in the chairman's statement and the statement of Senator Talmadge. This committee has a tough job, and anybody who doesn't think so just ought to think about it for a little while. But believe me, it makes it infinitely tougher if we are cast in the role of conducting a circus or entertainment. It does not help the demeanor of these hearings. It does not help a witness. It does not help this committee, and it positively detracts and the objectivity and the even-handedness with which we've tried to conduct this undertaking. So I join with the chairman and compliment the chairman in making that observation. I very much hope that the guests of this committee present today and future guests of the committee will uh, scrupulously adhere to, to that admonition from the chairman. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a brief pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the public broadcasting service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the hearing, Senator Talmadge is inquiring about the authorization for the break-in at the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. If you had thought that the psychiatrist profiles had been in a lockbox in a bank in Washington, you wouldn't authorize the entry, would you, Mr. Ehrlichman? Mr. Chairman, I wonder if, if we could uh, perhaps escalate this to the level of seriousness that it was viewed in the government at the time. This was not simply a, an effort to pick up gossip. This was an effort to crack what was, at that moment, the largest raid on top secret documents that had ever been made, made in the history of this government. I, I think agree it would with be your much statement more that I thought it was a thoroughly reprehensible act. But does one reprehensible act authorize another? Let, let me suggest the, uh, the magnitude or the co-magnitude might be this kind of a situation. Let us suppose that you knew that in that safe deposit box, there was either a device or the conclusive information about some attack that was going to be made, a, a nuclear attack that was going to be made the next day. Now, does the power then extend to getting into that safe deposit box, or do we say uh, a man's home is his castle, his safe deposit is his castle, and so let the bombs come? 
Don't you think under those conditions you could have gone to the bank and gotten those documents very hurriedly? I think probably there would be a very cooperative banker. And my assumption was that there might be a very cooperative psychiatrist or nurse or nurse's aide or someone who, without breaking and entering, uh, would have uh, permitted uh, I don't the, argue uh, with your statement that the president has power to repel an immediate attack. He has that power. But what we're talking about here is an unauthorized entry and burglarizing a man's premises well, who wasn't even involved in stealing the papers in the first instance. I have, to, I have to say to you that as the seriousness of the problem is presented, I think you're exactly right in your suggestion that you could enlist the cooperation of individuals to avoid the, the cracking of the bank uh, or the cracking of the, of the doctor's office. And uh, uh, my reaction when I first heard about this was one of disapproval because it certainly wasn't in my contemplation that there was going to be a breaking and an entering here. My contemplation from the, from the beginning was that this could be done without that. Now, did the president authorize that break in? Not in express terms, no, sir. Now, at least not to my knowledge. Matter no. of fact, in the subsequent statement, he expressly denied it, didn't he? That, I read his statement, and uh, I have heard testimony here. I, in, I would not be totally responsive to your question, however, if I did not add one thing, Senator. On the 24th of July, I sat in a meeting where the President gave Mr. Krogh his charter, his instructions. I must say that the President put it to Mr. Crow very strong that he wanted Mr. Krog and the people in this unit to take such steps as were necessary. And I can recall in that conversation specific reference to the use of polygraphs and summary procedure for the discharge of federal employees who might have been involved in this episode. Let me, let me read the President's own language to you, taken from the Congressional Record of May the 23rd, 1973. Consequently, as President, I must and do assume responsibility for such acts, despite the fact that I at no time approved or had knowledge of them. And he was talking about the break-in of uh, Fielding's office. Senator, I think it's important in that same connection, however, to read the previous two paragraphs, which say, at about the time the unit was created, Daniel Ellsberg was identified as the person who had given the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. I told Mr. Crow, this is the President speaking, that as a matter of first priority, the unit should find out all it could about Mr. Ellsberg's associates and his motives because of the extreme gravity of the situation and not then knowing what additional national secrets Mr. Ellsberg might disclose, I did impress upon Mr. Krogh the vital importance to the national security of his assignment. I did not authorize and had no knowledge of any illegal means to be used to achieve this goal. However, because of the emphasis I put on the crucial importance of protecting the national security, I can understand how highly motivated individuals could have felt justified in engaging in specific activities that I would have disapproved had they been brought to my attention. Now, that refers to this July 24 conversation between the President and Mr. Krogh. And I must say in, in, uh, uh, that, that I think that is a fair characterization of the urgency which the President expressed to Mr. Krogh and undoubtedly uh, uh, a recognition of the fact that one in Mr. Krogh's situation might well believe that he had been charged with taking extraordinary measures to meet what the President described in very graphic terms. Now, you should also know that at this same time, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty negotiation documents had been compromised, so that the President, uh, by the 24th of July, knew that his negotiating position versus the Russians in the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty negotiations were known to the Russians and, and uh, 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 literally the negotiations had been compromised. He discussed with Mr. Krogh in very graphic terms the disadvantage at which he found himself now 
in trying to conduct this country's foreign policy and work out this arms limitation, having had these secrets uh, uh, displayed. Mr. Ehrlichman, isn't it a fact, assuming for the sake of argument that your theory is correct, that the President could authorize such a break-in? Isn't it a fact that the President himself and not Mr. Ehrlichman would have to authorize that break-in? Sir, I did not ever authorize a wiretap or any other extraordinary measure Who on my own entry, on my answer. own on my own say so uh, when I answered mr. Dash yesterday about whether I had authorized such and such uh, in no case was that on my own say so uh, in ever in every case in which uh, I transmitted an authorization to the Attorney General, uh, it was after referral to the President and his express approval. When was the field in break-in? Uh, as I said yesterday, Senator, I have heard two dates, but it was sometime over the Labor Day weekend. September 1941, in any event. 1971, yes, sir. Now, when was the New York Times case tried? and they authorized the publication of those papers in the New York Times. I don't think I have the date of Wasn't decision. Wasn't June 1971? I don't have the date of decision of that. Really? I can't disagree with you, Senator. Isn't it a fact that the break-in occurred more than 60 days after publication of those papers in the New York Times? Oh, uh, I think two things have to be said here. One, the investigation was not to prevent the newspapers from publishing the Pentagon Papers, because that was, of course, an accomplished fact. The investigation here was to find out who had stolen top secret documents and disseminated them, not only to the newspapers, but, and, and we have, at the time, strong reason to believe that the documents delivered to the Soviet Embassy were not the same documents as were printed in the New York Times. I think you know, Senator, that there was a, there was a disparity, there was a difference between what was printed in some of the newspapers on the one hand and what was, uh, for instance, uh, delivered to the Congress on the other. And there were actually about three different versions of these documents uh, in existence. Uh, by versions, I mean different, different documents in different sets going around. And so it was entirely reasonable to believe that the Soviet Embassy had received more sensitive documents than those that had been printed in the New York Times. But the main point here is that the investigation was not to stop the publication in the newspaper. The investigation here was to determine how so many vital top secret documents could get out of the federal government assuming and for the into, the, into the hands of a foreign power. Assuming for the sake of argument that you're entirely correct on your legal premise, which I don't, I could conceive of a break-in on Ellsberg, but I can't conceive of a break-in on his doctor, well, who had I've, nothing whatever to do with national security. I, I understand. As I've said before, Senator, the investigative technique here of the psychiatric profile required information, just as the uh, uh, determination of who the co-conspirators were required various kinds of information. Now, you might go to a service station attendant to d get information about who Mr. Ellsberg's friends were. That doesn't mean necessarily that the service station attendant was a co-conspirator. And certainly mean? there's no suggestion here that the psychiatrist was in any way a co-conspirator. He was the holder of what they considered to be important investigation information, as I understand it. Why didn't the FBI handle the job? Well, I've, I've explained that yesterday. Uh, the situation was a unique one, uh, which the Attorney General described to us, in which the Director simply refused to permit his top people, uh, Mr. Brennan particularly, to conduct interviews of some of Mr. Ellsberg's uh, uh, family. And uh, it, was a, uh, it was a situation where the case was not being treated as a primary case by the Bureau, 
uh, and, and Mr. Krogh came to us and said, I can't move the Bureau on this with the kind of cooperation that this case deserves. You're not saying that the President of the United States was helpless in trying to get the cooperation of the FBI, are you? I'm saying that the Attorney General reported to the President an extremely difficult situation with the Director which he felt could lead to the resignation of some of the top people in the Bureau, that while the Attorney General felt that he could reverse the Director's decision with regard to the suspension of Mr. Brennan, he did not think at the time that he could force the Director to an acceleration of the Bureau effort on this subject you don't without, a, without a total rupture with the Director. You don't mean to animate in any way, shape, fashion, or form, do you, Mr. Ehrlichman, that J. Edgar Hoover was in any way soft on communism or national security, do you? J. Edgar Hoover clearly was not that. At the same time, uh, it appears that uh, Dr. Ellsberg's father-in-law was a very close friend of his. And I think everyone who knew the director knew of his loyalty to his close friends. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield at this point. Thank you, Mr. Ehrlichman. Thanks, sir. Senator Garner. Senator Garner. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, since we're on this <coughs> Ellsberg break-in again, I would like to uh, clarify the record of yesterday uh, just a bit. As I understand it, you testified in response to questions from Mr. Dash that the Justice Department, and more particularly Mr. Peterson, uh, had the information about the Ellsberg break-in a year ago. Uh, that was not of your own knowledge, was it? No, sir. Where did that come from? That came from Mr. Dean in the first instance, and then it came one step removed from Mr. Krogh, who quoted to me what Mr. Dean had also told him. That is what I would like to clear up because, of course, this is a very serious allegation against both the Justice Department and especially Mr. Peterson, who was the chief of the criminal division. Uh, he has made an affidavit on this subject, and I understand this is on file in the Ellsberg case, which is otherwise known as United States against Russo. And I would like to submit the affidavit at this point in the, the record, Mr. Chairman, I won't bother to read it, but to summarize quickly what it says, it says, uh, and this is an affidavit of Mr. Henry E. Peterson, who is the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division of the Justice Department. He says, I have no information, I've had no information regarding an alleged unlawful entry on or about September the 3rd, 1971, into the office of Daniel Elberg's psychiatrist until April the 16th, 1973 when the allegation contained in a memorandum from Earl Selbert was submitted to me. I am unaware of any information received by the Justice Department in connection with its investigation of the unauthorized disclosure of the Pentagon Papers. And in the case of the United States against Russo, which came or could have come from the alleged burglary by E. Howard, Haji, Gordon, Liddy, and others of the office of Daniel Elbow's psychiatrist, Dr. Feeling. The Xerox copies of the photographs of what apparently are exterior shots of the building and parking lot in which Dr. Feeling's office is located were first delivered to the Criminal Division of the Justice Department in about October of 1972 by the CIA in connection with a request made by the prosecutive staff of the so-called Watergate case for background information pertaining to certain defendants, including Hunt. The significance of these copies of photographs to the then unknown alleged break-in of Dr. Feeling's office was, of course, not then realized, since I had no knowledge whatsoever of the Department of Justice file and the Pentagon Papers until that matter was transferred to the Criminal Division as a result of the abolition of the Internal Security Division, March 26, 1973. And the significance did not thereafter become apparent until a check was made of the CIA material in the Criminal Division on or about May 3, 1973, in connection with the case of the United States against Russo as a result of the government disclosure of the memorandum of April 16, 1973 to me. I thought it was only fair to Mr. Peterson to put that affidavit 
which gives his version of how he came to have knowledge of the alleged break-in of Ellsberg's psychiatrist, and that, of course, was not until this year. Senator, I certainly have brought you only hearsay on this. I understand. I did it not for the purpose of the truth of the statement, but I did it in response to a question about what I thought at the time about who knew about this. Now, what the affidavit doesn't say that you all might be able to determine is whether or not Mr. Dean was correct in what he told me about what those pictures showed, because he told me that one of the pictures was a picture of G. Gordon Liddy standing in front of Dr. Fielding's nameplate, and that the other pictures were pictures of ransacked premises. Now, if, in fact, the affidavit's correct and they got these things in the Justice Department back in October of 1972, which would have been some time ago, with G. Gordon Liddy standing in the foreground, that might cast more dignity upon Mr. Dean's statement to me than just taking the bare affidavit. But again, I hesitate to say out of fairness to Mr. Peterson that I don't vouch for the truth of what Mr. Dean told me about this. I just have to tell you what I thought at the time. Well, I realize that, and my introduction of the affidavit was in no way to impeach your testimony, but only to show that Mr. Peterson has an entirely different viewpoint of this, which I think is important from his point of view as well as the Justice Department. It also raises an interesting point, too, about how Mr. Dean could have found out a year ago if the Justice Department itself didn't receive the information until October of last year. That certainly is a conflict of testimony. Mr. Barton, I think maybe I'd better put in the record that this affidavit, which you've offered without objection on the part of any member of the committee, is received as an exhibit, and the reporter will mark it appropriately as such. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the important pieces of testimony that we have received in these hearings, Mr. Ehrlichman, involves this whole matter of executive clemency, whether the President ever authorized anybody to offer executive clemency to any of the defendants. And as I'm sure you know, this has come up in our testimony. And I'd like to examine that area for a moment. First of all, did you have — your log shows that you had meetings with John Dean on January 3rd, 1973, January 4th, and January 5th. Would you tell the committee what the subject of those meetings were, beginning with the third? If I could — On January 3rd, I met twice with Mr. Dean, once alone at noon and once at 7 p.m. with Mr. Colson. The meeting with Mr. Colson related to a letter which Mr. Dean had told me about at our earlier brief meeting. And this was a letter which I believe Mr. Colson had received from Mr. Hunt. I believe I'm correct about that. It was a very melancholy and a very passionate kind of letter. I think the letter is in record, as a matter of fact. And it talks about his being abandoned by his friend and so on. And it was on the heels of Mr. Hunt having lost his wife. Mr. Colson was genuinely concerned and shaken by this. He'd had a long friendship with the Hunts, both Mr. and Mrs. And he had proposed to Mr. Dean that he get together with Hunt, or with Hunt's attorney at least, to register his continuing friendship and his compassion for Hunt's 
uh, loss of his wife and so on, and uh, so that Hunt would not feel that he'd been abandoned by his friend. Uh, this is the uh, thing that we discussed with Mr. Colson that evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, I took it as, a, uh, as almost a given in the meeting that there would be some contact between Mr. Hunt, and, uh, uh, Mr. Hunt or his attorney and Mr. Colson. Uh, and it was simply a question of what the proper conduct would be under the circumstances, uh, being obviously delicate to, to uh, have a White House contact of one of the defendants right at this particular point in time. So it was discussed, and it was discussed in terms not of a personal meeting between them, which is what Mr. Hunt apparently wanted in the, in the letter, but Mr. Colson talking with uh, William Bittman, who was then uh, Hunt's attorney, and conveying this message of, of uh, support, personal support, uh, uh, through that avenue. Uh, Mr. Dean raised the cautionary uh, uh, warning that if anybody from the White House sat down with Mr. Bittman in a situation like this, that there was an inevitable opportunity for uh, uh, misunderstanding as to the purpose of the meeting, as to assurances that might or might not be given, and so forth. Uh, clemency was obviously uh, at, at the forefront of everybody's mind in this meeting as one of the things which uh, uh, was a potential danger area. And I advised both people at the meeting, Mr. Dean and Mr. Colson, of a previous conversation that I had had with the President on that subject and indicated to them... In that was back in July, was it? Yes, sir. Indicated to them the, the substance of that conversation, which was that the President wanted no one in the White House to um, uh, get into this whole area of clemency with anybody involved in this case and surely not make any assurances to anyone. Mr. Colson said that he was sure that he could avoid that pitfall uh, and have the, have the conversation. He was advised by Mr. Dean to uh, either take notes or make such mental notes of the conversation that he could reconstruct the conversation if, if the question ever came up again. And that is what Mr. Colson did. We had a subsequent meeting where... Hey, before we go to the subsequent meeting, could you be a little more explicit in your testimony as to how the discussion arose about executive clemency, who brought it up, and who said what on the subject at the January 3rd meeting? I can't say who brought it up, Senator. We were going over the, the potential problems that could come from Mr. Colson having a contact either with Mr. Hunt or his attorney. Uh, it had been his... Uh, firm practice not to have any contact with Mr. Hunt because of the imputation, uh, because, uh, uh, frankly, everybody knew they were close, that they had been close friends. There had been a lot of suspicion that somehow Mr. Colson might be implicated in the Watergate because he was a close friend of Mr. Hunt's, and Mr. Colson was leaning over backwards to do everything he could to avoid giving any credence or credibility to that suspicion. So uh, when we got into the, the uh, decision that he would have contact with uh, Bittman rather than Hunt, uh, I, I think it was John Dean who said, you're going to be, you're going to be asked whether uh, you're willing to, to uh, uh, get Hunt out at some time in the future. And, and uh, this How did Dean know that he was going to be asked? Well, we were, it was conjecture, but I mean, it, was in the, it was in the realm of what kinds of problems are you liable to confront and you better be ready for this and, and look out and what's, what's your response going to be. I think both Dean and I had some mental reservations about the, the desirability of this, but Mr. Colson had a very strong uh, uh, friendship urge, so to speak. I mean, here was this, this really moving letter, and he, and he was saying, I just can't leave this fellow without hearing from me. Now, how do we go about this? All right, now you have a meeting on, Jan on January the 4th, the next day. Did that involve this subject at all? No, that included uh, Attorney General Kleindienst. 
And it had nothing to do with the Hunt problem? No, I don't believe so. I don't think it was ever mentioned. I see you had a meeting, too, on that day, January 4th, with the President. Did you discuss Watergate in any fashion on that meeting? I don't recall, Senator. Uh, that would have been my first meeting with the President after I came back from about a two-week absence. My guess is that the, the um, well, let's see, about an hour of that, I think, was by my, no, let's see, that was with the President, Mr. Haldeman, and then Mr. Uh, Dr. Kissinger came in for about 45 minutes of that meeting, and I believe that was a catch-up session on just the, the uh, problems that had accumulated during my long absence, but I, I just don't have any recollection of specific topics. Do you have notes on that meeting at all? Well, I do, but they're, uh, they're not in my custody, and uh, uh, have I, you I have to go like an elephant and, and suck up the, the contents and then come somewhere and try and, and uh, regurgitate them. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's a laborious process because we, as you know, are not in a position to make any, any uh, notes or, or copies. So have, have you I don't checked have that it. meeting recently, the notes of that meeting? No, sir, I, I haven't. And uh, all, I can, uh, all I have is the President's log that shows who was in the meeting. Let's turn to January the 5th now, a meeting with Dean and Colson. Right. Does this involve uh, Hunt and clemency again? What I don't that know, Senator, whether that is the meeting where Mr. Colson reported on his meeting with Mr. Bittman or whether it was on the 25th of that month. There were two meetings with both Dean and Colson following the January 3rd meeting. My recollection is that at some point in time, rather soon after he had met with Bittman, Colson and John Dean and I sat down again and Colson recounted to us what the conversation had been. Well, why don't you <clears throat> describe that to the committee, whether it was on January 5 or at a later date? He gave us the strongest kinds of assurances that he had not uh, made any sort of commitments, that he felt that Mr. Bittman had very guardedly and, if you'll pardon the expression, covertly, uh, advanced feelers to him, which he rebuffed. And he made a uh, rather long, detailed memorandum for his file about the conversation in all its subjects and gave a copy to Mr. Dean, either at that meeting or, I guess, subsequently thereafter, uh, very shortly uh, thereafter. Now, if you recall, <coughs> Mr. Dean testified before this committee and was very positive in his testimony that as a result of this meeting that occurred on January the 3rd, Ehrlichman uh, checked with Nixon and told Colson to give Bittman assurance clemency would be offered. Now, I'm not quoting him, but that's the <clears throat> right. gist of what he, he testified to. Would you comment on that? Yes, sir. Uh, that is a story uh, that had an out-of-town tryout, like many of Mr. Dean's uh, uh, episodes. Uh, what, what we'd see is that uh, the story would appear in one of the news magazines or in a newspaper as, in a certain version. And then the, when Mr. Dean got here to testify, he had a slightly different version, but the differences were extremely material, and this is one of those. The version which got the tryout was that I had jumped up from the meeting, run out, presumably to the President's office, come back and said, fine, fellas, it's all set. You've got it. And uh, that had its problems uh, because, of course, the, the meeting to which he was referring didn't take place until 7 o'clock in the evening. And uh, the President's log uh, makes very clear the fact that I had no meetings with the President that day. And so, factually, the, the printed story in the media wouldn't wash. Now, when Mr. Dean testifies, his story was, well, we had this meeting and this was discussed, and then I heard a day or two later that Mr. Ehrlichman had given assurances to Mr. Colson that he had checked this and that it was okay. 
Now, that likewise isn't going to wash because the only meeting that I had with the President, as shown by the President's log and by my log, was a meeting which involved other people uh, at uh, half past, no, at 3.02 on the, on the 4th of January. And Mr. Haldeman was in the meeting the entire time. Dr. Kissinger was in the meeting a substantial portion of the time. And I can assure you, Senator, that executive clemency was not discussed at any time. You never took up this matter with President Nixon at any time. I didn't have to. Except I in had, July. I knew what talked. the marching orders were from, from July. And I particularly knew because it was, my, it was my strong feeling, which he ratified and adopted, that this was a closed subject, that we must never get near it. And that uh, it, would be, it, it would be the surest way of having the actions of these burglars imputed to the president for there to be any kind of entertainment of conversation, whether polite or otherwise. And to put it bluntly, your testimony is that John Dean told an untruth. Yes, sir. Twice. Once in the out-of-town tryout and once here. He had another comment to make in regard to uh, this particular clemency business. That was after you were supposed to have told Colson that he could tell Bittman that clemency would be offered. Dean brought up the question that other people would want clemency too. And his testimony is that uh, you said, well, that would go for others also, something to that effect. What about that testimony? No, sir. That, that falls with the, for the same reason that the other one does. Uh, I, had the, I had the strongest conviction that we must never discuss executive clemency. Either the president must never discuss it, but any of us must never discuss it with any outsider for just the kind of reason that, that we're seeing in this situation now. Uh, I didn't have even a, a scintilla of a hint that anyone was making a, an approach, for instance, to McCord. That whole thing was a, was a total revelation to me. And a, and a monumental error, in my, in my opinion. There's one other little facet here. I suppose the best evidence will be when <clears throat> Mr. Colson comes before us. But there also is testimony from John Dean that uh, he said that Colson also discussed this matter of executive clemency with the president. And the president uh, said, uh, yes, uh, you can offer executive clemency for Hunt. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. That's not the exact the testimony. What about that? Did Colson ever talk to you about any conversations he ever had with the president no, on sir. the subject? No, He did not. Did you ever ask him whether he uh, had any conversations with the president? No. On executive clemency? No. When, when Dean and Colson and I talked about this, I, I went through the substance of my July conversation with the president. And one of the things that I mentioned was, and not in pointed terms at Mr. Colson, but just generally, was that I didn't think anybody ought to talk to the president about this subject, outsiders or staff people, that it's just a subject that should be closed as far as the president was concerned. I always, I always hesitate to ask a question like this, and yet <clears throat> I, I'm intrigued uh, with this uh, particular area because you have a very clear memory about it. It certainly was talked about, executive clemency. And I, I'd like to ask you, uh, why do you think uh, John Dean has testified that the president offered executive clemency through you and through Colson? Well, and, of I, course, brought it up, as he said, uh, to Dean himself. I, I take it, Senator, and here I'm speculating, uh, rankly speculating, here is an episode with Mr. McCord, which comes out through Mr. McCord back through Caulfield to Dean. Now, how does John Dean justify having sent Mr. Caulfield to talk to McCord? Uh, I don't know whether that's the explanation or not, but it certainly was suggested to me as I watched Mr. Dean at this table spinning this tale. Let us go to another area that involved you and, and Mr. Dean. And that are the papers that were taken from Hunt's safe after it was opened by uh, Dean's people. Some of these papers, as you know, were very sensitive. 
uh, some contain in a briefcase of Mr. Hunt's. Uh, testimony, of course, here is that Dean had a conversation with you about this, and you made some suggestions about uh, disposing of the papers that were in the briefcase. My recollection is that you advised uh, Mr. Dean to deep-six these papers. Would you care to tell us about this meeting? That was a uh, meeting, if I, if I heard the testimony correctly, which was also attended by other people and should be susceptible of, of uh, uh, determination from independent witnesses. Uh, to correct an assumption in your question, Senator, I did not know the contents of Mr. Hunt's safe, uh, except in the most general terms. Uh, I was told, uh, and I can't say who told me, probably Mr. Dean, that there was a, a pistol and a, a tape recorder and a number of documents, some of which had nothing to do with Watergate but were very politically sensitive. Now, that was the, the general description. I had no occasion to look at them. I, I never saw them except as a few of them were sealed in an envelope and handed to Pat Gray. The conversation uh, has to be weighed, the probability of such a conversation where I said, run out and throw this in the river, has to be weighed against what I actually did, which the, I think the witnesses who were in the meeting on the 19th will tell you that I did. We had a meeting for two purposes on the 19th, which included uh, Mr. Colson, Mr. Curlie, the staff secretary, and Ken Clausen on the White House staff. The meeting was for, as I say, two purposes. One, to try and determine what the facts were about Howard Hunt's employment status, which was very murky at that point in time because of some lack of documents or some confusion of documents and things of that sort. The other purpose was to talk about what to do about this safe, which had been found on the premises and apparently had things in it that related to Howard Hunt, who was then, a, uh, if not arrested, at least a prime suspect. The instructions which we agreed upon at that meeting were that a number of people should be present at the opening of that safe. We knew we had to have somebody from the GSA because they had to open the safe. But in addition to that, I specified that Mr. Curly be present, that Mr. Dean be present and take custody. And then I think Mr. Curly suggested that a Secret Service agent be present under the circumstances because we were breaking into a safe in the White House. And so that was the arrangement that was agreed upon before that meeting broke up on the 19th. Now, having and, of course, my purpose in doing that was twofold. One, it's kind of an extraordinary procedure, and I thought there ought to be people who later on could explain what actually happened. Two, I was concerned about the, the uh, uh, custody of these documents, the chain of evidence, the perfectibility of, of, of proof, if the time came, that there were important documents in there that bore on uh, Mr. Hunt's liability. So that was done, and it was done, I believe, that same day. Yes. Or that evening. Now, it, it seems to me uh, that it would have been folly for me at some later time then to suggest that the, the briefcase be thrown into the flood tide of the Potomac or, or uh, that these papers be thrown in the river or something of this kind. Now, there was in this story also the suggestion of shredding. I don't think in my life that I have suggested to anybody that a document be shredded. Shredding is just not something that I uh, have ever resorted to under any circumstances, nor proposed to anybody under any circumstances. As I said, we have a, we have a great disposal system at the White House. If you really want to get rid of a document, you put it in a burn bag, and you seal it up, and it's never opened again, and it goes into a furnace, and that's the end of it. But to get back to this second meeting, when <clears throat> John Dean uh, comes to you and tells you we've got some pretty sensitive papers here, and as he alleges, uh, you say, well, deep six this briefcase. What is your testimony on I that? did not, Senator. I, d I have no recollection of that kind of a conversation. It was did you make any other suggestion to him that he 
dispose of these papers in any other way. We discussed what to do about some papers which he told me about in the safe that really should not be leaked. Again, we have to come back to our FBI problem. And he was genuinely concerned, and when he explained it to me, I shared his concern. These and if the these documents were simply wholesale to the Washington field office of the FBI, that we would be reading about it in Time magazine in very short order. Now you're talking about the ones that were turned over to Gray. And so uh, uh, Mr. Dean came up with this idea of turning them over to Pat Gray personally. And I certainly concurred in it. I thought that was an ideal solution to the problem. Now, did that come up at this meeting when supposedly the Deep Six uh, conversation came up? Well, I, don't, I gathered that that meeting was supposed to have been the meeting when Mr. Curly and the others were there. It would, have, it would have necessarily been at that meeting because the die was cast thereafter. We had, you know, the 20 bishops had witnessed the opening of the safe at that point, and they were just, uh, uh, so it had to be that meeting. Now, I, do, I don't know what meeting he's referring to. We I think he said it was the 21st. The 21st. Well, I met with Mr. Dean uh, the 21st in the afternoon. I, I, the only thing that I can say to you is that I certainly would not have and did not propose the destruction of those documents. Well, let's get then to, that's clear enough, uh, let's get to the, uh, the gray papers. As I understand your testimony now, uh, Mr. Dean did raise these sensitive papers that if they were just filed away in the FBI regular files and somebody got to them, why, it would be very embarrassing to a lot of people. That's what he said. Uh, what happened uh, to those papers? Those Tell papers. your version of the story from his first telling you these were sensitive papers. We've got to do something different with them. He agonized for several days over what to do about this situation. I was not involved in a lot of conversations with him about it. He was gone a couple of days during this interval uh, because the river was flooding on account of Agnes Hurricane. And uh, his house was near the river. And so he was, just, he was just out of the play for a couple of days during that particular period of time. He was moving his furniture up and, and uh, I don't know, putting up sandbags and whatnot. And uh, so he came back from that um, interval and said he thought he had an idea as to how, to how to solve this problem. And that would be to deliver these documents in two parcels, one parcel to the field office and the other parcel to Pat Gray. I certainly concurred in that suggestion. It seemed to me like a, a good way of making sure that the documents didn't leak as long as Mr. Gray held on to them. This was his suggestion to turn them over to Gray. Yes, sir. And then what happened? And I said that either that I would get Mr. Gray to come over, but I think what I said to him was Mr. Gray was coming over that day for a, a, another appointment. And uh, why didn't he just bring him over when Pat Gray was there and, and deliver him to him so that two of us could say that the delivery had been made and we would put an end to this evidentiary chain, so to speak. As I understand, he did come over and he did bring the documents, and Gray and you and he were there. Then what happened? We were there. Uh, he said, Pat, I'd like to, to give you these. It was, it was um, the sense of it was that these were contents of Hunt's safe that were politically sensitive and that we just couldn't stand to have them leaked. Uh, that uh, he, uh, he proposed, I don't know whether he talked to Gray before or not, uh, because Gray seemed to understand the, the setting and the, and the premise, so to speak. And he turned the documents over to him and John Dean then left. Did you say nothing during this whole meeting? I probably chimed in on the subject of leaks, which was then kind of a, uh, was, was a theme that I was hitting with Mr. Gray right along. And uh, the, uh, as I've testified before, I, I don't recall the specific language that was used, but the sense of the conversation between the three of us, which was not a long conversation, was that the purpose of Pat Gray taking delivery of these was to avoid the leak problem which all of us recognized that the FBI was having. Well, I seem to recall there was some testimony about 
too gray by someone, either Dean or you, that these documents should never see the light of day. Do you recall that? I don't think, um, well, I don't know whether there was testimony about that. That is not a phrase that I've ever, that I've ever testified to. I don't recall that phrase being used. Your recollection, then, is that it was just made known to Gray that these were very sensitive documents, and he ought to make sure that they were kept very sensitive and no one saw them. Is, is that well, the gist of it? No, I think the word politically was in there. I think it was very clear that they, w they had political overtones rather than uh, saying sensitive from a national security standpoint or something of that kind. Was there any discussion in that meeting that would give uh, Gray the thought that he ought to destroy them? No, sir. You're I, positive on that score. I, I, and the reason that I'm positive, Senator, is that when I heard that he had, in fact, destroyed them, I was just nonplussed. There, there was just nothing in the contemplation of the people in that room at the time of the delivery that would have led to that kind of a conclusion. Did you ever have any uh, communication with Mr. Gray about these documents after that meeting? Yes, sir. And recount that to the committee. That was in April of this year. We had a conversation. The President asked me to telephone Mr. Gray. It was a Sunday night. And it was the 15th of April at about uh, 10, 15 p.m. Uh, I was in the President's EOB office, and he had had a meeting that day with Mr. Kleindienst. The subject of these documents came up at that meeting, and the President asked me to call Mr. Gray and find out what the documents were and where they were. Uh, so I did that. Uh, Mr. Gray was not home. When he got home, he called back, and we completed the conversation in the President's office. Uh, I, do you want the substance of the conversation? Yes. All right. Uh, I told him at that time that uh, the delivery of the documents to him uh, had been the subject of this conversation between the Attorney General and the President, that uh, uh, Mr. Dean apparently had told the prosecuting attorney about the fact that he had made the delivery. Mr. Gray said, well, he can't say that. And I said, well, you know, he did say that. And he said, uh, if he says that, I'll deny it. And I said, well, Pat, it isn't a, it isn't a subject for denial. Uh, uh, obviously, it's not something you can deny. Uh, I recall the episode very clearly. Well, he says, you've got to back me up on this. Uh, then he went on to say, I've destroyed the documents. That totally nonplussed me, and I said something rather confused and said goodbye and hung up and reported to the President that he had, in fact, just told me that he'd destroyed the document. We talked about the implications of that, and I said, I don't think that I completely closed the door with Mr. Gray just now on whether or not I would back him up if he denied receiving the documents. So I placed a second call right then. And I said, Pat, I didn't respond clear enough to your suggestion. And I just want to tell you, as I have to tell you, that I would have no choice if I were asked but to say that I was present at the time the documents were delivered to you. And he said, I understand. I guess I'll have to do what I'll have to do, or words to that effect. And that was the end of the second conversation. Thank you, Mr. Ehrlichman. I think my time has elapsed, Mr. Chum. Unless there's some objection, the committee will take a recess at this time until 2 o'clock. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the caucus room, Senator Irvin has a few words for the spectators.
Now, I wish to re reiterate the request to the audience to, to refrain from uh, expressing approval or disapproval of anything said or done. I have to say that probably Senator Baker and myself were guilty of a little contributory negligence this morning. We got sort of humorous ourselves, and we laughed ourselves and probably set an example for others. But uh, I do ask, in the interest of the work of the committee, in the interest of fairness to the witnesses, that the uh, audience will refrain from expressing approval or disapproval in any audible manner in respect to any matter or thing. It would certainly facilitate uh, the work of the committee as well as uh, contribute to uh, a proper hearing. Uh, Senator, in all, in, all, in, in all ways. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ehrlichman, a few days ago, Mr. Alexander Butterfield described in great detail the electronic audio recording devices which have been established and installed in the White House, in the Oval Room, in the Executive Office Building, and elsewhere. Yesterday, in a colloquy with one of my colleagues here, when the tapes were mentioned, you indicated that uh, you were certain that if these tapes were made public, they would support your, your contention. They will support your innocence. Is my memory correct, sir? That's my feeling, Senator. The President of the United States has by letter indicated that he has no intention to release these tapes. And tomorrow, I presume, we will know uh, very officially what his decision will be. But it would appear at this point that these tapes will not be made public. I've heard legal scholars suggest that this fact could serve as a defense for persons who may be indicted for certain criminal activities which may have involved uh, the White House. One may argue that the tapes include indispensable evidence to prove innocence. And this would be sufficient to, for defense to move for the dismissal of an indictment. Uh, what are your thoughts, sir? Well, as I tried to indicate yesterday, uh, I've been on the other, the other side of the, of the problem here, where I was sitting by the president trying to approach a problem which involved the rights of individuals and also the interests of the country. And they frequently don't coincide. No, uh, my, my question. I, I understand. No, and, and my question is if, now this is a very iffy question, uh, please forgive me for it. If the United States prosecutors should decide to indict you for some crime, and uh, as you've indicated that the tapes may well provide you with evidence that would prove your innocence. Could you use this as a defense and have the case dismissed? It's never occurred to me, Senator, and I wouldn't touch the question with a 10-foot pole, frankly, for fear I might somehow affect uh, my rights or someone else's rights, and I, I think you would be sensitive to that. Uh, it, it is not something that has occurred to me, and I hasten to say it's not anything that I've talked to anyone in the White House about. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a new, it's a new wrinkle as far as I'm concerned. I started to respond in terms of uh, my interest, uh, which uh, is not, I feel, this prejudiced. This aspect was never discussed with anyone? I have never discussed it with anyone, no, sir. Mr. Ehrlichman, your record indicates that you're a, a fine lawyer. You've served for time as the president's most trusted legal officer. You've been in private practice. And so I, I would assume that, like most of us here, you're aware of the, the code of ethics, 
written and unwritten about the profession. The legal profession? Yes. Yes, sir. We have certain ethical yes. codes. Now, in early 1973, April 1973, the so-called U.S. versus russo Ellsberg case was uh, uh, in full bloom. The papers were covering this uh, almost daily. It was a matter of grave interest and concern, not just for the press, but for, I think, members of the Congress and the people of the United States. Now, in April of 1973, you called the presiding judge, uh, Judge Byrne, didn't you, and invited him to visit you at San Clemente? Yes, sir. And it was to discuss a possible appointment of Judge Byrne as the director of the FBI? Well, generally speaking, yes. Not, not precisely, but generally. And you involved the President of the United States, who is also a lawyer, in the discussions? I involved him? No, sir, I did not. Did the President also meet Judge Byrne? Yes, but I can't say that I involved him. Uh, as Judge Byrne and I were walking, uh, the President came out of his office and came over and greeted Judge Byrne. What was the nature of your conversation with Judge Byrne? Uh, my conversation, Senator, uh, I, I'd like to go back and, and tell you how the conversation occurred, if I might, in order to put it in, in setting, if you have no objection. Please do, sir. It was evident that the Gray nomination was uh, not going to be sustained. And at the President's instruction, uh, I contacted Judge Byrne. As it happened, uh, before I talked to Judge Byrne, I talked with the Attorney General and told him of the President's instruction to me and of the fact that Judge Byrne was going to be coming to San Clemente uh, for a meeting. The Attorney General expressed his wholehearted approval of that meeting. He was a, a very enthusiastic um, uh, advocate of Judge Byrne to be nominated if Mr. Gray could not be. The conversation which I had with Judge Byrne on the telephone was substantially this. I said, Judge, uh, I have been asked by the President to call you. I have been asked to discuss with you a federal appointment which is not judicial in character. I don't know whether this is an appropriate time for us to have a conversation like this, because I don't know what the present situation in your trial is. The impression I had from the newspapers was that the case was in its last stages. They were either in sur rebuttal or had completed sur rebuttal. And I didn't know at that point uh, what the, what the posture of the case really was. But you were aware at that point that the judge had not rendered his decision? Well, it was a jury case, and I, I was aware that the given case had, not, the had not gone to the jury yet. So I said to the judge, this is not a conversation that, that is urgent. We need not have it now, but at some point in time, uh, I would like to have this conversation. The judge responded, I see no reason why we couldn't talk right away. So I said, well, uh, if that's the case, uh, what's convenient for you? This was a, a Friday. I, er, yes, Friday. Uh, he said, well, I could come down this afternoon. So I said, fine, and that's what happened. We set an appointment for 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he came down to my office. When he came into my office, I said, again, I am sensitive to the fact that you are trying an important lawsuit. I propose that we take a walk out toward the bluff from the office. If at any point a subject arises that you feel in any way impinges upon your ability to fairly try the case, you just turn around and walk away from me. And as I said before, this is not something that needs to be discussed right now. We can, we can talk about it later without prejudice. 
He said, fine, let's proceed on that basis. So we did. We walked out to the bluff and back, and it was a conversation of perhaps five minutes total. Uh, the gist of the conversation was that I advised him that it was the President's conclusion that he was going to have to resubmit a nomination for director of the FBI, that he was interested in knowing whether or not Judge Byrne had an interest in the position. If he did, then obviously uh, uh, any decision on the President's part as to a nomination would finally be the President's, but that it would be uh, uh, helpful to know of his interest. The judge indicated very strong interest. He told me a number of his uh, experiences with the FBI, that is to say he had been a U.S. attorney, he had had a number of experiences with the Bureau, he had some ideas about how the Bureau was falling short, uh, some ideas about how it might be improved. He mentioned uh, just that he had those ideas without getting into it in any great detail. So he gave me an impression of, of uh, very clear interest. Uh, as we walked back, as I say, the President came out of his office, didn't know the judge apparently, uh, was introduced to him. They chatted just very briefly, not about the case obviously, but about uh, just pleasantries. Their conversation lasted perhaps 30 seconds, and the President went back in his office. We returned to my office where I said, well, I think the way we have to leave this is that I now know you have an interest and that obviously the President has to reserve his options completely as to whether there ever is an offer to you or not. So that was the, that was the end of that conversation. Next day, during uh, uh, there was a second conversation, Senator. I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. It, it, I take it you would like me to recount that. Please do so. The next afternoon, about mid-afternoon, which would have been Friday, uh, my secretary interrupted a conversation I was having to say that the judge was on the telephone. I took the phone call. He said, I've been giving a lot of thought to our conversation of yesterday, and I would like to talk with you again. And I said, fine. My instructions are to be available to you. Uh, I would be happy to see you. When, when would you like to? Uh, well, uh, no, I said, uh, th there's a problem. We're leaving uh, day after tomorrow to go back to Washington. Uh, could we work it in in the next couple of days? He said, yes, I would be available on Saturday. I said, fine. I'm planning to be in Santa Monica on Saturday. Would it be possible for us to meet there? And he said, sure, we could work that out. So I said, well, my mother lives a block from Palisades Park in Santa Monica. Why don't we, why don't we meet there and we can have another walk? And he said, fine. So we made an appointment to meet at uh, Ocean Avenue and Montana Streets uh, by the park uh, on Saturday in the middle of the afternoon, which we did. Uh, we had a short walk during which he again evidenced very strong interest. Uh, he did not press me for an offer. Uh, when we got finished with the conversation, which again took about five, no more than ten minutes, uh, he got in his car and left. Again, no offers had been made, no acceptances. But I took this as an occasion when he wanted to restate his very strong interest to me uh, in the position. And it was, it was more symbolic than it was significant from the standpoint of content. This all occurred at a time when Judge Matthew Burns was the presiding judge in the case of United States versus Russo, Ellsberg, and others. And I think it would be an understatement to say that your interest and the president's interest in the outcome of the case was more than casual. <coughs> You've indicated your interest in the Ellsberg situation uh, to the extent that you had the psychiatrist's office uh, burglarized. This was a case of major importance as far as the Justice Department was concerned. You wanted the outcome to be in the favor of the government. And under all those circumstances, you still felt it was proper to call upon the presiding judge to make this offer? 
Don't you think it was highly improper and unethical? Senator, I can't accept your question without quarreling with some of your assumptions. I'm, I'm sorry. But uh, you very, very easily stated that I was the instigator of the burglary of Dr. Fielding's no, office. No, no, no. Let's that, say that you have nothing to do with it. I can't, agree. I can't agree with that. But you were aware that a burglary did occur. Well, I'll accept, you, you I'll had accept approved, that. But you it, had it, approved uh, a covert operation to get me, information legally, as you said. Let me respond directly to, yes. your, directly to your question. I can assure you that there was no such motive in, in my thought at the time of this, of this meeting. And I'm sure that is also true of the Attorney General, and I'm sure it's true of the President. We were trying to get the best man that we could to be director of the FBI. And that was the sole and singular motive. Now, I have scoured the canons of ethics uh, to find, and I'm bringing this up because you referred to it at the outset, to, refine, to find where uh, I had in any way uh, infringed upon them. Bear in mind, I was not in the capacity of an attorney. I hadn't been in the capacity of an attorney for some three years in the government. I was a member of the executive branch. I was the president's agent in this matter, and my function in this was purely ministerial. I don't accept the suggestion that I was an officer of the court, so to speak, in this, in this setting. I simply wasn't. Now, I take some comfort from the fact that I did this with the full knowledge of the Attorney General of the United States, who had all of the, all of the facts, which I did not. He was aware that you were going to offer the FBI directorship to the judge? Well, I didn't offer it. I, he was aware of precisely you what I was going to do. I, he was aware of precisely what I was going to do. Weren't you aware that this would present an impression of impropriety? I was not. Why were you sensitive about this? Why was I sensitive That's about the it? Word you well, used, the I, was, I was sensitive as anyone would be because I was not personally as familiar with the progress of that trial at that time as you evidently were from the reading of the press. I had to depend on the judge to tell me the proprieties in this matter. He was in possession of all of the facts. Then I, I was in possession of few, if any of them. Then I gather you were much surprised and shocked with the reaction of the public and the reaction of the legal profession when this was made known. I in candor, I have been surprised, yes, sir. And I think it is because, uh, in, in part because, it has not been fully explained. I'm grateful for this opportunity to tell exactly what happened. And you still maintain that the Attorney General and you, in calling upon the judge, did nothing improper or unethical? I, I would be very grateful to you, Senator, if you could specify uh, the canon that you feel applies here. I've not I've taken advice on this, and I have not been able to determine, except in the most nebulous and general terms, some rather vague feeling that people have that a canon has been violated. Uh, as I say, and, and without laboring, laboring the point, I'd be, I'd be very grateful to you for that specification so that I can respond to it. I, I appreciate the sensitivity of approaching any sitting judge. Now, I don't imagine there's a federal judge in the country who doesn't have a case involving the United States government before him on his docket somewhere or in the process of trial. Uh, it may be that the logical uh, implication of what you suggest is that the executive branch should never offer a federal judge a, a position. But this was not an ordinary case. Well, you know, he that reminds me of the story of the... You mean you weren't in the, in the outcome of the Ellsberg case? It, it reminds me a little, Senator, of the, of the story of the railroad claim agent who had the picture of the cow on his wall. And the fellow says, what, what's so special about that cow? And he said, that's the only ordinary cow that the railroad ever hit. Uh, every, every case in a, in a matter of this kind gets to be the, the extraordinary case, I'm sure. Uh, I think that in approaching this as I did, talking with the Attorney General, talking with the judge in the terms that I did, I hedged this about with as much precaution as I knew to do and still carry out 
the explicit instruction that I had from the President. You had conversations with the judge on two separate occasions. Did you at any time advise the judge of your knowledge of the break-in into Dr. Fielding's office? No, sir. Why didn't you advise him that, sir? Well, I think that would have been extraordinarily improper from two standpoints. I'd like to know. Well, the first one, of course, was that I was under a strict injunction from the President as to that entire national security subject matter. But secondly, for a member of the executive branch to talk to a sitting judge about a matter affecting a trial before him at that time without going through the counsel to the President or the Attorney General or the trial lawyers involved in the case, it seems to me would have been, if what I did was improper, that would have been impropriety squared. That would have been the farthest thing from my mind to do. It is your testimony today that this meeting had nothing to do with the possible outcome of the trial? Well, certainly, I can only speak for my motive, and I think I can fairly speak for the motive of the President and the Attorney General, that that simply did not enter into it. I've been sent this note from the Chief Counsel on the canon of ethics. The attorney is under duty not to impair the confidence of the public in the integrity of the judiciary. Well, I'm afraid that is a great catch-all. Number one, of course, I was not a — Isn't that rather clear? Sir? Didn't it give the impression to the public that an attempt was made to compromise Judge Byrne? Well, if it were given, it was certainly a false impression. I am certainly comfortable in the precautions that I took in indicating to the judge that he was free not to engage in this conversation, that I was relying entirely on his own knowledge of the state of that case. And I don't know what else I could have done under the circumstances. Mr. Ehrlichman, yesterday you told the committee that you were not able to discuss the activities of the Special Investigations Unit, the so-called Plumbers Group, because the President has directed that the highest security classification be applied to the activities. Am I correctly stating your position, sir? I'm not sure that that was the reason that I intended to assign to that. In point of fact, executive privilege has also been invoked. Do you or the President of the United States consider the activities of Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy in relation to Ms. Dita Byrd as vital to our national security? No, sir, and I didn't include it in that. I don't know about those activities, and they certainly had nothing to do with the activities of the Special Unit. Weren't you aware that Mr. Liddy and Mr. Hunt were involved? No, sir. When did you learn of this? Well, I heard something in testimony here the other day about Liddy, and I'd forgotten who testified that Liddy told him that he had taken her out of town. That's the first I'd ever heard of that. Of course, I heard about Hunt going to Denver some time ago in the press, but I don't believe that I had ever heard of that before that. And I think there's a lot of confusion about Hunt and Liddy's participation in this Special Unit. So far as I know, after the break-in at Dr. Fielding's office, Hunt and Liddy ceased having participation in the investigations or the supervision of agencies by the Special Unit. I'm not aware of any specific activities that either one of them engaged in for the Special Unit after, oh, about the 8th or 9th of September, something of that kind. So it would have been a total participation of July 24th to September 9th, 8th, someplace in there. Do you recall the former Attorney General, Mr. John Mitchell, discussing the matter of White House horrors with you? Because he did testify that he discussed this with you in great detail. I had never heard that phrase used until he appeared here. But he described what he meant by that. 
and one of the matters described was this involving Miss Dita Bird. I, I don't believe that I have ever discussed that Dita Beard business or Hunter and Liddy with Mr. Mitchell. You're suggesting that Mr. Mitchell's memory has failed him. Well, I, I let me go a little, a little beyond that. Uh, I believe Mr. Mitchell testified that he was not aware of the plumbers until sometime later. Uh, my log will show that almost immediately after the president authorized this special unit the 24th of July, I scheduled a series of appointments with cabinet officers to take Mr. Krogh and Mr. Young around and introduce them and to explain what this special unit was designed to do with relation to the stimulation of activities within the respective departments. And I had an appointment with Secretary Laird. And I had one with Director Helms. I also had one with Attorney General Mitchell, with Mr. Krogh and Mr. Young, for just that purpose. And that would have been late in July or early in August of 1971. So I think Mr. Mitchell's recollection on this general subject may be a little hazy. But you're testifying here that you became aware of the involvement of Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy with Ms. Beard. It just came about recently, a few days ago? Well, that's a few days, a few months ago. Hunt and Liddy simply went out of my, went out of my, off my screen, so to speak, uh, about the time of this uh, uh, fielding break-in until one meeting which I referred to here the other day that I think Liddy was in sometime in the month of October when he was back doing staff work with regard to uh, straight uh, domestic uh, policy work for Mr. Krogh, which involved the organization of the Justice Department. Uh, I think that's the only time that I thought of or heard about Hunt and Liddy uh, subsequent to uh, those dates in September. When you heard of the fielding break-in, did you disassociate yourself with that activity and admonish those who were responsible? Yes, sir. Did the president do likewise? No, I don't think so. The president had no reason to because I don't think he was informed of it. I thought you testified to the effect that you advised the president of this break-in. Well, no. I, the, as far as I know, the president learned of it from someone else, not from me. The first specific recollection I have of discussing this subject with uh, this special, special unit activity with the president was in March of this year. Now, I may have had some conversation with him previous to that date, but I have no recollection of it. Why didn't you do something about this? Sir? Why didn't you do something about Mr. Hunt and Liddy? Uh, there's well, nothing in the record to show that they were admonished or they were punished or they were put in bad graces. Hunt and Liddy, as far as I assume, had a, a complete defense in the sense that they were operating according to what they believed to be authorization. The reaction that I had to this when I heard about it was one of surprise and disapproval. My initial reaction was to pull them back from their trip west, which I suggested to Krogh be done immediately. And it was done, as far as I know. And so your response to Mr. Krogh, not your response, the White House response to Mr. Krogh's activity was a presidential appointment. I think you have, if I could, if I could just finish the answer and then I'll come to this yes, if you'd like me to. At, at that point in time, there were two, what I suppose you would arguably call conflicting duties, uh, to have imposed uh, some kind of discipline, uh, to have uh, had them arrested, something of this kind has been suggested as, as one of the alternatives. Obviously, the other alternative was to pursue this national security investigation as vigorously as we could and not compromise it if we could possibly avoid it. You get into these conflicting duty situations, as you know, Senator, at times, and you have to, you have to take the main chance. You have to do the thing that uh, is more important to the country and not do the other thing. It's, it occurred to me the other day that it's very much analogous to the dilemma of this committee, where you're confronted with the conflicting rights 
of individuals who may be prejudiced by this whole process on the one hand and what you conceive to be the larger national interest. And you have resolved that conflict in favor of the larger national interest, even though some individuals may be harmed in the, in the long pull by the process. And I can understand that. At the same time, when you find yourself in the bite of that line, sometimes it's hard to explain from a hindsight standpoint your evaluation of what the more important thing to do what was. What was the larger national interest? The larger national interest, sir, was in finding out all we could about who and under what circumstances these vital national secrets, these top secret documents, were compromised. Did it also include the prosecution of Dr. Ellsberg? Now that was that was really not what this was about. Uh, really not what this was about. The Justice Department was well underway on that, and they were handling that, and they continued to handle it. This was a particular undertaking to try and find out how this happened, who did it, how it could be prevented in the future. I have many other questions, Mr. Ehrlichman, but uh, my time is up. I have just one final question, sir. You have maintained throughout that in all of your service in the White House, especially in those activities evolving around the Watergate, you did no wrong. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. That every act on your part was legal, proper, and ethical. That's my belief, and I, I trust that's true. If that's the case, why did the former Attorney General of the United States cite your resignation as evidence of the President lowering his boom? Well, I suppose that was a convenient landmark at that time, and he undoubtedly is not aware of the President's considerations and motives uh, at the time that I resigned. If you're clean, why did he fire you? He didn't fire me, sir. And uh, Why didn't he insist that you stay on board? Well, as a matter of fact, the proposal for me to resign came from me. It did not come from him. At the time that I talked with him on the telephone, and I'm trying to remember the date, it would have been the 28th or 29th of April, just in any way leading up to my trip to Camp David on the 29th, the state of things were, was that I was to take a leave of absence, but stay on the White House staff and continue to perform as many of my functions as possible, given the need to answer charges and, and do all these other, these other collateral things. The President was quite content with that at that time. It was Bob Holdeman and I talked. We felt that from our respective standpoints, that was simply not realistic. It was not viable. And it was we that proposed to the President that we make a clean break rather than the other way around. And you're maintaining that you had no knowledge of the cover-up, and you further maintain that the mastermind of the cover-up was John Wesley Dean III. Well, I would like to speak for myself. I had no part in any cover-up. Uh, I'm not here to make charges against other people. I, and as you say, this is not a this is not an accusatory forum. Uh, I think the evidence will speak for itself when it's all in, and then uh, either you or the public or someone will be in a very good position to decide the answer to that second question. I would hope that the President of the United States will release those tapes because it will help to clear the evidence, sir. Thank you very much. Senator White. the justification for the plumbers group. I had a question on my pad, which was asked by another member of the committee, as to why the plumbers, why not the FBI? I believe, and you correct me if I'm in any way stating this 
or paraphrasing it incorrectly, that your response was that you were not getting cooperation from the FBI and had the opposition of the director, Mr. Hoover, and that was the justification for the plumbers. Now, is that yes, correct? No. Uh, the special unit itself was created in response to a strong feeling by the president that the White House had to more closely supervise the departments, the agencies, in their efforts, and that is in the departments and agencies' effort, to do their own job inside the departments and agencies in plugging leaks, finding out who were disseminating these documents and so forth. So the, or, the origin of that unit and the, and the original reason for it being was for that purpose. It was not originally set up as a, a police organization or an investigatory organization or anything of that kind. But then, when Mr. Krogh ran into this hard place in getting information, uh, it was a last resort to use these two people who were in the unit to do this one particular investigatory job. Because, in fact, the information could not be obtained by the FBI, is that correct? Would not, yes. Would not. I'd like to read to you, and uh, I believe your counsel will now hand to you an exhibit, or rather a letter, which I would hope we would uh, put in as an exhibit, dated August 3rd, 1971, from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, this was uh, some time before the actual break-in. It is a letter to Mr. Krogh from the director, J. Edgar Hoover. And I'd like to read the letter. The Honorable Eagle Krogh, Jr., Deputy Assistant to the President for Domestic Affairs of the White House, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Krogh, by a letter dated July 29, 1971, the President advised me that he had directed that you examine in depth the circumstances of the many recent disclosures of top secret and other sensitive material to the public. He asked that I forward to you all information acquired to date including individual reports of interviews with respect to 17 persons who were named in an attachment to his letter. One of these was Daniel Ellsberg, principal suspect in the disclosure of the McNamara study to various newspapers. He asked that a comprehensive background paper on Ellsberg be sent to you. Enclosed are 17 memoranda containing the information mentioned by the President. We have interviewed five of the individuals involved in connection with our investigation in the Ellsberg case, we also endeavored to interview a sixth one, Mr. Charles M. Cook, but he declined to submit to interview by the FBI without the specific clearance of Deputy Attorney General Richard Kleindienst. If you concur, we will proceed with interviews of all the remaining individuals except Daniel Ellsberg. By separate communication, I am furnishing a copy of each of the enclosures to the Attorney General. Upon removal of the classified enclosures, this transmittal letter may be declassified. Sincerely yours, J. Edgar Hoover. Would you say that this is fairly clear evidence that the FBI was perfectly willing to perform its functions insofar as the Ellsberg matter was concerned? Well, I don't think I'm able to respond to that, Senator. Uh, I think all of us who have had experience with Mr. Hoover uh, recognize that letters of this kind uh, were a, uh, a method that he had uh, frequently of justifying uh, shortfall in performance by the Bureau. Uh, I don't know whether this was window dressing or what this was. Uh, it was obvious that the, the President had, at Mr. Krogh's request, shaken up the Director. And uh, uh, I, I will say that over a period of, of uh, a couple of months, the result of having appointed the, the special unit and the result of having uh, the President having told Mr. Hoover that he was having to resort to sending two people out there from the White House caused the Bureau to um, uh, wake up on this thing. Now, this comes rather early in the process and looks to me like, a, 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 I don't know, but it looks to me like Mr. Hoover was sort of cleaning out the drawers and sending over everything that had been accumulated to that time. Uh, uh, most of what was sent over, I'll bet you, was old hat stuff. I do have a very vivid recollection of conversations uh, prior to this date, but around this period of time, with both Mr. Krogh and Mr. Mitchell, where the problem of the Bureau's lethargy 
was discussed. The reason for the President's call and, and uh, follow-up letter to Mr. Hoover was because of this lethargy. And I don't think it's going to be possible to make the case that the Bureau was just on its tippy toes doing everything it should right at this period of time. Uh, the, the fact that the President had to call, had to write, the fact that Krogh was uh, banging me, the, the fact that I was over on the, on the Attorney General asking him, and then the Attorney General coming back to me and saying, well, we're at a hard place in this, uh, uh, is all, I think, a matter of record. It will take some digging to get into, uh, but I think it's there, and, and you all could adduce it. It, 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 the Council suggests that it might be well to know if there's any other uh, more or less contemporaneous correspondence, a reply back from Mr. Krogh or anything to indicate uh, whether he agreed with the assumptions stated here uh, uh, that would set this more or less in, in context. I'll let the letter go ahead and speak for itself. I have no further correspondence to go ahead and submit at this time, but I would ask this question. Do you feel, in other words, that Mr. Hoover is lying in this letter? No, I think Mr. Hoover is resorting to a well-known bureaucratic device uh, of uh, papering the file, and, uh, and particularly a device that's familiar to those who uh, have uh, seen the President uh, shake up somebody uh, in one of the departments or agencies you immediately get a, uh, an enormous volume of justification back. And when you thumb through it, you see most of it is um, uh, stale bread. It's, it's old stuff that's been in the file, and they put together a big package, and they send it over hoping that the sheer volume is going to impress you or th make you think that everything's okay or that, the, that uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing I've seen dozens and dozens of times since I've been here. Well, would you advise, then, that every time a department or an agency of this government falls short, that rather than remove the head of that agency or department, we set up a similar function on a secret basis? Is that the way we're going to handle it? Oh, no. It? No, indeed. No, indeed. And I think in, in retrospect that, um, and, and I think you'll recognize that all through this proceeding, we keep coming back to bureau problems. I think in retrospect that, that uh, uh, the administration would have been far better off if Mr. Hoover had been retired uh, earlier, uh, 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 predating uh, this episode, because many, many of the problems that um, uh, we encountered were uh, as a result of Mr. Hoover's very fixed views, very sincere. Uh, he, was, he was alert, he was sincere, he was patriotic, but he was certainly fixed in his views, and it made uh, operation uh, very, very difficult. Now, when you run across a situation where you have a, a uh, retirement of that kind that is politically sensitive and difficult, uh, sometimes uh, the decision is made to postpone the retirement. And when that happens, then you simply have to find other ways of doing things. In other words, I gather what you're saying is he was fixed in his views to the extent that he would not agree to a break-in of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Well, that, that, of course, uh, overstates it dramatically, Senator. Uh, what, he, what he wouldn't agree to was an investigation of uh, uh, Mr. Marks and, and others close to Daniel Ellsberg. Well, now, Mr. Ehrlichman, we have a letter saying that he will agree to go ahead and investigate. It's sitting right there before you. Well, it didn't, uh, frankly, Senator. And you say, I'm asking you, is he lying? No, I don't see, for instance, Mr. Marx's name in there, and I don't know what the list is that that letter refers to. Maybe Mr. Marx's name is on it. He says, if you, will, if you concur, we will proceed with interviews of all the remaining individuals. Who are they, Senator? I, don't, I, I honestly don't know. I don't remember ever seeing that letter. I can tell you this, that uh, uh, by, oh, the 20th of September of that year, the Bureau was clicking on all eight cylinders. Uh, they were aboard. And the Bureau work was moving ahead, and, and uh, uh, we were past the problem. Past uh, what problem? Sir? Past what problem? This, this uh, uh, view of the, of the uh, directors that he would not so treat this as a principal case. In other words, we'd establish the principle that, that breaking and entering was uh, a, a proper Oh, no, 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 I, I, I reject that totally. I, I, can't, I can't accept that. Uh, the, the director was never involved 
well, what in is, any discussion what is, what is, of, of breaking and entering or anything of the kind. What is clicking along on all eight cylinders? I mean, they were treating this investigation as a principal case, and it was getting the kind of top priority that uh, Mr. Crow very much wanted for him. So that, in effect, uh, the director was not lying, but uh, he was merely stroking. I think that's the White House expression, is it not? Stroking. Uh, no. Mr. Crow, uh, by means of the letter, and in effect not doing the job. Is that correct? I, I don't think stroking is the apt term there. I think perhaps uh, uh, we think of this more as puffing than stroking. As what? Puffing. Puffing. Oh, I see. Uh, Senator Weicker, Sen may I ask Counselor? your permission to interrupt you a moment to Counselor address the right. chair? Mr. Chairman, I noticed that this document was, exec was exhibit number two of the executive session. Will you be kind enough to ask your staff if there is a series of documents relevant to this document which followed it, or to tell me that, that you don't have any? You have, I think, al already, um, uh, Mr. Wilson, have seen uh, two other documents uh, that uh, the, uh, the memoranda that have already been shown yesterday to uh, Mr. Ehrlichman uh, were also exhibits of the executive session. That doesn't answer my question, Mr. Dash. My question is, for example, <coughs> did Mr. Krogh reply to the, to the director's letter? Were the internal memorandums that you picked up? In other words, the witness has been handed one letter and the fact is in suspense. I want to know if you possess, if you please, if the chairman will permit it, yes. a sequence of letters or, 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 or internal memoranda following this, or that you assure me that you don't have it. No, no uh, this is the only document in this correspondence that was, was submitted in the executive session of this case. Now, I ask you another question. Is it, is it the only document you have in the possession of the staff? relating to this same subject matter. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. In other words, you just answered me that no other document relating to this was ex exhibited in executive session. My question, with the, with the chairman's permission, is, is whether there are other documents in sequence in the possession of the staff. In sequence of uh, this letter? Yes. No. Thank you. Now, I'd like to, if I could, uh, clear up uh, some matters relative to explanations, your explanations of the uh, Ellsberg break-in. On June the 28th, 1973, you stated in a telev television interview that relative to what you told Crow, quote, while I expressed my disapproval in the strongest kind of terms, as he said, and as a matter of fact, made clear that I thought that this whole, this whole investigation ought to be terminated with these people, that they didn't evidence good judgment, and that ought to be the end of it. That was your statement in this particular television interview. How does your statement to Mr. Wallace less than a month ago stand up against your statement to this committee that you believe the break-in was a proper enterprise uh, since it was done in the name of national security. Well, Senator, I've said just this afternoon essentially the same thing that you just read. Uh, I had not contemplated this break-in. It was a surprise to me. I felt that it was a mistake. I asked these people to be brought back, and I think not, not 30 minutes ago I said so here. At the same time, taken as a part of a, of a chain, uh, referring now to the activities of the special unit and going to the question which the chairman and Mr. Wilson were talking about this morning, I don't think there's any question about the legal foundation which exists for an activity of this kind. I'm, I am the, the, the sort of person who doesn't like surprises. And when I understand that an, an investigation is underway, uh, uh, certainly uh, an event of this kind takes me aback, and it took me aback. Now, I'm not sure I understand. 
either your words or the words of your counsel. Are we either justifying the breaking or are we condemning the actions of Hunt and Liddy? Well, I think there, there are a couple of subjects there. And I think the way we got into all of this in the, in the first instance was as to whether or not I had a concern about the propriety, speaking of the, the legalities now, the propriety of this event a year later at the time of the Watergate break-in to the extent that I was willing to suborn to perjury or bribery or all these other things that have been charged. And my response to that was that I felt comfortable with the propriety from a constitutional and legal standpoint at the time of the of the Watergate break-in. And that had been my that had been my conviction and conclusion for some time. Now I didn't I didn't express disapproval to Mr. Krogh because I felt uh, some technical illegality had occurred. I felt I felt that it showed bad judgment. It was a surprise. It was not anything that had been contemplated or approved. And I felt that those fellows ought to be brought back. So your disapproval was on the basis of you were surprised. I uh, certainly was. So was that the basis of your disapproval? Well, no. My my disapproval was because these people, as far as I knew, had been sent out there to do an investigation. I was under the assumption that it would be conducted as a normal investigation, not as some kind of a, of a second story job. And uh, when I heard this, my initial reaction to it was, somebody has not exercised good judgment. Now, I'm still operating under the assumption that that judgment was not exercised, in, at least independently, by Hunt and Liddy. I have been uh, uh, under the assumption right along that they were operating pursuant to what they thought was approval. And so I, I'm in a hard place to say that, that they are, uh, in response to your question, they are to be condemned or, or fired or something of this kind. Are you telling me, in other words, that you thought that it was constitutional, but that it was botched? Is that right? Well, I don't know what, what botched means. Uh, uh, there's no question in my mind, if the thing had been presented to me in the terms that it occurred and I had been asked for approval or disapproval, I would have disapproved it. All right. So that it was constitutional, but that it was embarrassing. Would that be a better word? Well, it certainly was potentially not only embarrassing uh, in, a, in, in a, what, a political sense or something of that kind, but uh, totally... Um, totally out of keeping with the, with the concept here. These fellows were going out as substitutes for the, the FBI. And the, the method, the style, the degree of investigation, which I understood was going to be conducted, would have been commensurate with that, not some, some uh, uh, different kind or, or uh, uh, category of investigation. So the committee will stay in recess uh, so the members of the committee can go and vote. As the senators pause for a vote on the Senate floor, we're going to interrupt for a moment. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a break for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the hearing, Senator Irvin and Mr. Wilson are resuming that legal debate over authorization for the so-called Ellsberg break-in. I'm, I'm going to respectfully request the audience not to make any kind of a demonstration or indicate in any way their approval or disapproval of anybody or anything, including myself. 
Senate's going to have several more votes and uh, be very little interrogation of the witness before in the morning. But I do want to take this occasion to, uh, I said I wanted to amplify something about the legal discussion. And I want to mention a little uh, I want to mention a little of the Bible, a little of history, and a little of law. The concept embodied in the uh, phrase, every man's home is his castle, represents the realizations of one of the most ancient and universal hungers of the human heart. One of the prophets said that described the mountain of the Lord as being a place where every man might dwell under his own vine and fig tree with none to make him afraid. And then uh, this morning, Senator Talmadge talked about one of the greatest uh, statements ever made by any statesman. That was William Pitt the Elder. And before this country revolted against the King of England, he said this, the poorest man in his, may in his cottage bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the King of England cannot enter. All his force dares not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. And yet we are told here today and yesterday that what the King of England can't do, the President of the United States can. The uh, The greatest decision that the Supreme Court of the United States has ever handed down, in my opinion, is that of uh, Ex parte Milligan, which is reported in the Four Wallace Two, and the things I want to mention appear on page 121 of that opinion. In that case, President Lincoln, or rather some of his some of his uh, supporters raised the claim that since uh, the Civil War was uh, in progress, that uh, the military forces in Indiana had a right to try for treason a man who they called copperheads in those days that was sympathetic towards the South, a civilian who had no connection with the military forces. So they set up a military commission, and they tried this man, a civilian, in a military court, and sentenced him to death. One of the greatest lawyers this nation ever produced, Jeremiah Black, brought the matter to the Supreme Court. And he told in uh, his argument, which is one of the greatest arguments of all time, how the Constitution of the United States came into being. He said that the people who drafted and ratified that Constitution was not more determined, that not one drop of the blood which had been shed throughout the ages to wrest power from arbitrary authority should not be lost. So they went through all of the great documents of the English law from Magna Carta on down, and whatever they found there, they incorporated in the Constitution to preserve the liberties of the people. Now the argument was made by the government in that case that although the Constitution gave a civilian the right to trial in civilian courts and the, the right to be indicted for a grand jury, 
before it could be put on trial and then the right to be tried before a petty jury, the government argued that the president had the inherent power to suspend those constitutional principles because of the great emergency which existed at that time when the country was torn apart in the civil strife. The Supreme Court of the United States rejected the argument that the president had any inherent power to ignore or suspend any of the guarantees of the Constitution. And Judge David Davis said, in effect, the good and wise men who drafted and ratified the Constitution foresaw that troublous times would arise when rulers and people would become restive under restraint and seek by sharp and decisive measures to accomplish ends deemed just and proper, and that the principles of constitutional liberty would be put in peril unless established by irrepealable law. And then he proceeded to say that for these reasons, these good and wise men drafted and ratified the Constitution as a law for rulers and people alike at all times and under all circumstances. And then he laid down this a great statement. No doctrine involving more pernicious consequences was ever invented by the wit of man than that any of its provisions can be suspended during any of the great exigencies of government. And notwithstanding that, we have it argued here in this uh, year of our Lord, 1973, that the President of the United States has a right to suspend the Fourth Amendment and to have burglary committed just because he claims, or somebody acting for him claims, that uh, the records of a psychiatrist about the emotional or mental state of his patient, Ellsberg, had some relation to national security. Now, President Nixon himself defined the national security in one of his directives as including only two things, national defense and uh, relations with foreign countries. How in the world is the op opinions of a psychiatrist about the mental state or the emotional state or the psychological state of his patient, even if his patient was Ellsberg, can have any relation to national defense or relations to a foreign country is something which uh, eludes uh, the imagination of this country lawyer. Now, I'd like to ask you one question. Uh, why, if, if the president has this much power, wouldn't he have had the inherent power to send somebody out there with a pistol and had it pointed at the psychiatrist and said, uh, I'm not going to commit burglary, I'm just going to rob you of those uh, records and give me the records. Wouldn't he have had that right under your theory? Are you asking me, yes. Mr. Chairman? Well, I think this is the same question that Senator Talmadge approached. And undoubtedly, in a situation such as I put, for instance, where you knew there was going to be an atomic attack tomorrow, undoubtedly, uh, a measure of that kind might be necessary. Well, now, there was somewhere any... in between, somewhere in between, there is a line. Well, well, you and the line to... depends, obviously, on, on a lot of things that you and I can't settle here today. I think the thing that your argument artfully chooses to avoid dealing with. I'm not trying to avoid anything. I'm trying to hit this proposition. Well, President now, Mr. Chairman, you, you've interrupted me. The Fourth Amendment I, I, head on. You have, you have the delightful trial room practice of interrupting something that you don't want to hear. Uh, I'd like, if I could, to finish the sentence. The connection, of course, between the psychiatrist's records and the psychiatric profile and the determination of whether there was 
a spy ring or a foreign conspiracy which had taken these top secret dark documents and delivered them to a foreign power, it seems to me is an unbroken chain of circumstances that explains itself. Now, I recognize for the purpose of your rhetorical approach to the problem that it's fun to say, how could a man's emotional state be equated with national security? But in fact, there is a direct linkage step by step by step in this, which I think uh, we have to lay on the table and look at. Now, this business of going and pointing a gun at somebody, I can conceive of a set of circumstances, a different kind of national security situation, such as this impending attack or something of that kind, hypothetically, where such a measure might very well be the very thing that the President might determine was necessary. And you'll recall that the Congress, in recognizing this power, said, such means as the President shall determine. And that, I think, as Mr. Wilson pointed out this morning, was endorsed by the committee of which you are the chairman, sir. Well, well that's it? not what that bill said. It said that, that the President could exercise his constitutional powers when he determined, according to his determination, it didn't say he had any constitutional powers such as uh, as uh, you, you state because uh, Mr. Wilson himself both agreed that the court held in this case and the thing that held principally was that you couldn't elect, uh, exercise electronic surveillance without a warrant complying with the Fourth Amendment for the purpose of gathering intelligence about domestic subversion. And we also agreed that uh, the decision itself flatly held, held that the statute had nothing whatever to do with uh, the question of national security. Mr. Chairman, can I get into this? Yes, sir. I think this morning you referred to the Judge Field case, which is uh, strictly known as Cunningham against Nagel, isn't it? You remember that case? Yes, I remember the case that the Hill that you could send a, a, that a, a federal marshal wouldn't be guilty of murder for shooting a man that was, uh, that was trying to kill a federal judge. What was the statute based upon but the constitutional right? I don't know. I don't recall. It's been a long time since I shall read we it. Shall I prepare well, it for wasn't, this? It wasn't based on uh, Section 2111 uh, of uh, Title 18 of the United States. No, but it was, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was murder, though, wasn't it? It was homicide. Yes justifiable homicide in a statute which was supported by a constitutional theory. And also justified, it was happened in California, and it was justified by the principle of the common law that one person can kill another to prevent the consummation of a felony. Is this something that happened in California and no place else in the country? It, it would be the law in any case that had the common law system. Well, we've got that every um, place in the country except California and then and, and Louisiana. I'm unfortunately going to got the, the five-minute uh, notice about a vote. Thank you, sir. But uh, I, we... have, I have no quarrel with the Nagel case, but I don't think it's, the Nagel case merely applied uh, the rule that uh, a, a one had a right to kill another to prevent the, a wrongdoer from committing a murder. And all I say is there is a murder case that was justified. Yes, I regret I have to go and vote, and I would love to prolong this debate with you. I would, too. I think maybe that, uh, in the lateness of the hour, that uh, it would uh, that we just about a uh, recess till in the morning Thank you. at 10 o'clock. For the second day, John Ehrlichman has insisted on his complete innocence. And apparently, if he could relive the entire Watergate situation, he would make few, if any, changes in his own actions. Ehrlichman's position stands in contrast with most of the other witnesses so far. Even John Mitchell, who granted the committee very little, did admit that he might have made the wrong decision in keeping news of the Watergate from the president. In terms of his total protestations of innocence, Ehrlichman can be compared only with Finance Committee Chairman Maurice Stans. There are still a lot of questions for John Ehrlichman, and his continuing appearance as a witness could throw the whole committee calendar out of kilter. As things now stand, the committee plans to hear about a dozen more witnesses, including Charles Coulson and H.R. Haldeman, within the next seven days. But there now appears to be a possibility that Ehrlichman alone will take this entire week, and Haldeman could take an equal length of time. 
Chairman Irvin nevertheless says he still hopes the committee can conclude this phase of the hearings by August 3rd. This was a day of legal arguments, long breaks for Senate votes, but very little new from John Ehrlichman. Alan Barth, longtime Washington journalist and author, longtime observer of congressional investigations, is back with us. He and John Kramer, the Georgetown University Law Center, watched the hearings with us today. Gentlemen, what do you have to say for yourselves? First to you, Mr. Barth. It seemed to me that today was tremendously interesting. And coupled with the testimony yesterday, uh, it marks the movement of these hearings, I think, in a very, very ominous direction. Uh, I think that the legislative branch of the government is on a collision course with the executive branch and that that has very serious, uh, very serious portents <coughs> for our country. Uh, the nature of this controversy is marked not only by the president's refusal uh, to provide the tapes, but by his refusal uh, even to enter into a, a conversation, a conference with Senator Irvin, the chairman of the committee. And it's marked also <coughs> by, by the very great gravity of the constitutional principles that are at stake here. Uh, on the one hand, there is an assertion <coughs> that the president is not limited by the Constitution of the United States when he asserts that the national security requires him to act outside the Constitution, to assume powers which are den denied to him by provisions of the Bill of Rights. Uh, Senator Irvin made a magnificent uh, magnificent argument against that theory today. For my own part, I think that there has not been asserted since the time of uh, King George III uh, a notion that a man's house, a man's office, may be invaded by officers of the law without a warrant uh, when an executive asserts that, uh, that, that's, that national security justifies that not since the writs of assistance and general warrants which the founders of this republic rebelled against has there been <coughs> so so extravagant and so outrageous an assertion of executive authority. In other words, you do, you do not agree then that uh, this authority exists in any way above and beyond the facts of the Ellsberg case as argued by Ehrlichman and Wilson. I, I think that it is a contradiction of the very essence of our polity, the character of our political system. Ours is a system of limited powers, powers limited by a written charter, the Constitution of the United States, and the essential difference between a free society and a totalitarian society <coughs> is that a free society is one in which the government is limited in the powers which it may exercise. John Kramer, what are your thoughts? Well, I certainly... I hate to get back down to the sort of the mundane after the expression of judicial philosophy, which I certainly agree with in political philosophy. I should point out that uh, in 20 some odd years ago, the Supreme Court decided that a Soviet spy had privacy rights in his hotel room wastebasket, which he happened to weigh by throwing things in it, uh, which seems to be a little more than Mr. Ehrlichman or Mr. Wilson are willing to give a psychiatrist in Los Angeles. But with respect to today's hearings, I think you see the start of what may continue in the next two days of John Ehrlichman against the world. And I, I think for Mr. Ehrlichman, perhaps very dangerous because he takes on today, yesterday he took on Mr. Comback, obviously a very sympathetic figure. Today he goes after uh, Mr. Hoover, whom some people may not like for some reasons, but not normally for the reasons cited by Mr. Ehrlichman. He calls Mr. Hoover a bureaucrat, guilty of window dressing, and he's reaching out there, it seems to me, for an enemy, a dead one, that he doesn't really need. In fact, all of Mr. Ehrlichman's testimony sim seems to contradict almost everything everybody else says. Now, of course, he could be right and they could be wrong, but he's got an awful lot of people to stand up against. For example, there are several clashes in the afternoon and end of the morning testimony. The clemency issue. Mr. Dean has said that the president spoke to him about having talked to Ehrlichman and Coulson about clemency for the Watergate 7. Those are on tapes that the committee is trying to get disclosed. Mr. Ehrlichman denies any such discussions of clemency. In fact, says the president back in July talked about clemency, but said, don't talk about it. Nobody's asked why the president even brought it up in July. Mr. Hunt's safe and the contents. Mr. Ehrlichman says we had a whole sort of party in there watching uh, the safe being opened, and therefore we would never would have done anything with the contents of the safe. Dean says Ehrlichman told them to deep-six them. 
the Gray documents. Mr. Ehrlichman denies that he ever told Mr. Gray to hide the documents or get rid of the documents. Mr. Gray, in a hearing not involving the Watergate itself directly, said he did. What about Liddy and Hunt? We're left at the end of the day with wondering what happened to them. According to Mr. Ehrlichman, they disappear, for at least from his screen, he said, maybe from the White House, around the 8th of September, only to return at creep about six or seven months later. But according to Mr. Dean, he, he had to get approval from Mr. Crow through Mr. Ehrlichman to get Liddy released to creep. Well, this points up, uh, don't you agree, John, that uh, because of the delays today for the Senate votes and this long initial argument, that we, which Senator Irvin just came back to at the close, that uh, the rigorous cross-examination of Mr. Ehrlichman to pursue these and other points uh, uh, still has yet to come. And that comes uh, tomorrow. I think Senator Irvin says they hope to finish with Mr. Ehrlichman tomorrow. Seems uh, just off the top of your head uh, rather unlikely that they could, but we shall see. Gentlemen, thank you very much. During one of the recesses today, Senator Irvin offered his comments on the strained relations between the White House and the Senate committee. He was asked about reports that President Nixon thinks the committee is out to get him. I, uh, the committee is, is out to get nothing except the truth. But the committee is determined to get the truth wherever it may lead. I have said time and time again, and it's absolutely true, there was nothing that uh, I, I presume that the president is innocent. And I will give him the benefit of the presumption of innocence of any wrongdoing in connection with the Watergate until the evidence compels me to reach a different conclusion. But it would appear that you there's and the committee are on the enemy's list there's now. Nothing, there's nothing that would make me happier as an American citizen than to be able to say on the basis of evidence produced by this committee, including evidence of tapes and papers from the White House, that uh, the president had no connection with authorizing the, the Watergate or had no connection with any cover-up up, up, uh, uh, endeavors. Finally, just to take one of John Kramer's points a little further, it really is a very strange argument that John Ehrlichman is making about the Ellsberg break-in. He claims the president has an inherent power to authorize such an act, otherwise illegal, in the name of national security. He also claims the president didn't authorize the burglary of the psychiatrist's office, and neither did he, Ehrlichman. He says Mr. Nixon did authorize the plumber's unit to find out everything they could, as about Ellsberg is a matter of the highest priority. And Ehrlichman says he approved, in writing, what the plumbers called a covert operation to examine the psychiatric records. He didn't mean burglary, he says, and if he'd known that's what Hunt and Liddy intended, he wouldn't have approved. When he found out about the burglary, he was surprised and annoyed and ordered Hunt and Liddy back from California. Why was he surprised and annoyed if such an entry was justifiable, as he claims? Why did they exercise bad judgment if such an action could be justifiable on national security grounds? Did he fire them or move them off the case? No, because it was too important to find out about Ellsberg. Mr. Nixon also told us on May 22nd that it was important to find out about Ellsberg, but he didn't claim any constitutional justification for the burglary. Mr. Nixon said it was illegal. So why is Mr. Ehrlichman now making an argument to justify an act both he and the president say they didn't approve and which the president thought was illegal? It just doesn't add up, unless it's just a ploy to bait the easily aroused constitutional what watchdog lurking in Sam Irvin. If the object were to distract the committee from questioning him about other matters, it worked today. Or is Mr. Ehrlichman trying to suggest in a roundabout way that the president did approve the burglary after all. I repeat, it just doesn't add up. We'll be back tomorrow night. For Peter Kay and Jim Lehrer, this is Robert McNeil. Good night for NPAC. From Washington, you've been watching gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. This coverage is made possible by grants for special events coverage from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation and has been a production of NPACT, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association. <laughs>